Wednesday, May 24th. We are here with our good friends from the Environment Department uh, and the Parks Department to review the FY19 budget for parks as it pertains to dockets 0559 through 0563. Uh, Orders for the fiscal year 19 operating budget including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, and appropriation for other post-employment benefits, appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, and appropriation for certain park improvements. Uh, docket 0564 through 0565, capital budget appropriations including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. I'd like to remind folks that this is a public hearing broadcast live uh, and recorded on channel 8 Comcast, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. Uh, please silence those electronic devices, please. And at the conclusion, uh, actually I'm going to depart a little uh, from our normal procedure. I'm going to have a hard five minute stop on the first round. I'm going to allow five folks who signed up for testimony uh, to provide public testimony at that time and then at the conclusion of the second round we'll have the rest of the testimony. Um, uh, there is one more uh, session that we have for public testimony only that will be held on Tuesday, June 5th between 2 to 6 p.m. That's when members of the public can come to the chamber and uh, provide public feedback on any aspect of the FY19 budget since this is the last departmental hearing uh, prior to the votes. Uh, in order of their arrival, my colleagues, uh, Councillor Frank Baker to my left, Councillor Matt O'Malley, the Chairman of the Environment and Parks Committee, to my immediate right, to my far left again is Councillor Tim McCarthy, to my immediate left, Councillor Anissa Sabi George, to my far left again, Councillor Josh Zakem, over to my right, Councillor Ed Flynn, Councillor uh, Andrea Campbell, and Councillor Michelle Wu. I want to again welcome Commissioner, Chief, uh, and you have the floor. Department, Dennis Roche, who leads our finance, and also Nicole Duhamel, all from the Parks Department. The reason why our parks look like they're in such great shape is because of the great team that we've got at Parks and Recreation. Uh, today, I'm proud to say that Mayor Walsh is, for the fourth time in a row, recommending the largest budget in the Boston Parks and Recreation history. It's part of the Walsh administration's plan to move forward with the implementation of Imagine Boston as well as Climate Ready Boston, the city's uh, data-centric approach to climate change and climate change planning. As we do that, open space is going to play an increasingly large role and an important one in ensuring that Boston continues to be a healthy, innovative, and thriving place to live and work. And this historic recommended budget reflects exactly that, and it allows us to build on the success that we've had in this fiscal year. In FY18, some of our signature accomplishments include breaking ground on Martin Richards Park, a signature open sp space on the Fort Point Channel, prioritizing a deployable flood wall in the East Boston Greenway, and we continue to make strides on providing access to our open space to all Bostonians. Mayor Walsh has made inclusion and equity priorities for parks and recreation through his Parks First initiative. We made sure that these principles informed all the decisions that we've made, especially by ensuring that children from all neighborhoods have access to sports, enrichment, and cultural programs. Of course, in addition to the mayor's recommended budget, the Walsh administration is committed and excited to be working with the council on administering funds collected by the Community Preservation Act. These funds will help us accelerate improvements to access, inclusion, and equity as part of Parks First also. Lastly, in conjunction with our citywide plan, Imagine Boston, the Climate Ready Boston team continues to show us where Boston is most vulnerable to climate change and the steps that we can take to protect it. 
This is informing our work across the city, uh, but especially at Moakley Park, where we have an ongoing visioning process. As we develop these conceptual designs for green infrastructure and flood protections, parks will continue to provide support to integrate these ideas into our capital plans. Thank you again, and if it pleases the chair, I'd like to give Commissioner Cook the floor to give you more detail on some of our accomplishments and our plans for the next fiscal year. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Chief, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as you said before, my name is Chris Cook. I have the great honor to be the Parks Commissioner for the City of Boston. It's a great honor because of the men and women who work for the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. They work very hard. They have a very big mandate. There's a lot of acreage. Uh, and they, they work uh, every day uh, very diligently to make sure that those spaces are, are clean and that they're accessible and that there's an equity in how we distribute our resources. And I'm just very, very proud to be able to, to work with my colleagues in the department. Um, just very quickly, though, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the extraordinary contributions of our park partners in many of these spaces. Last night, we actually had a parks partner event uh, celebrating some of our key strategic partners. Um, great parks are made by great people. And often when you see a really well-maintained space, that's because there's a group of citizen volunteers who are organized uh, helping take care of that space. And so I'd be remiss to say that all of the great work is, is us alone. It's a partnership with the community. And uh, some of those friends groups are, you know, a grand total of two people who organize weekly cleanups. And some of those friends group uh, raised millions of dollars for our parks. And so each one of them is very important and we couldn't do it without them. We, we are very fortunate to put this budget before the council's uh, consideration. Uh, it represents a lot of strategic investments, things that we've never taken care of before um, that we should, you know, things like artificial uh, turf maintenance. So we've put in a lot of artificial turf fields over the past few years to take, to take care of those turf fields, to extend their life is a good opportunity. Um, that's in our general budget. We also have other other here, other important investments that we'd like to talk about. So uh, I'd like to turn it back over to the council for any questions you, that you have, and uh, we look forward to the opportunity to speak about this budget. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. and, and Chief. And uh, let me first uh, echo your comments uh, regarding the uh, the crews out in the field, Chris, Chris Lee and my district, uh, Ronnie Matera, you know, we always have to uh, work with Paul McCaffrey. Uh, if you want a tree, you have to go through Greg Mossman and Max Diamond and you. Um, so, and they all do great work. They're very responsive and Liza as well, working on, um, you know, the impacts on the parks and all the developments in our neighborhood. Liza's weighed in on so many of them and uh, to the betterment of all of those spaces. So I just want to thank, and for those I missed, I apologize, but you do have great staff. So I'm just uh, take through a couple of items on the budget. Um, you have, you know, a little uh, south of 600,000 additional uh, for employees. Can you speak a little to, uh, is that um, increases bargaining, collective bargaining, is it more staff? I think, yeah. I think there's a few more positions. Sure, so I'll have uh, Dennis Roach take you through some of the uh, the different reasons, whether it's CBA for the increases, but I do want to call out uh, two increases. Uh, one is Heidi Shork, or the Mayor's Mural Crew. Uh, Heidi Shork and the Mayor's Mural Crew actually started out in the Parks Department. Um, often, a lot of her art installations involve actual um, uh, natural elements. And so she's moved back to the Parks Department. Uh, we also have a lot of walls right. that she can help beautify. I don't want any counselors to get nervous. She'll still be working in the districts and still be beautifying walls as part of the graffiti uh, removal projects, right. but she'll be based out of the Parks Department. And also there's an investment in the Park Ranger system. But with that right. being said, I'll turn it over to Dennis Roach to, to answer the question more fully. Thank you. The additional um, the aspects of the budget and the increase is the collective bargaining, which you previously mentioned but also the additional to five seasonal staff that has been added to the maintenance crew um, to supplement our already seasonal staff that we have every summer. So we'll be adding five uh, seasonal staff that will be out right. there cleaning, maintaining all of our park systems. So that's a very strategic and, and right. an important investment in our parks. Yeah, I, I, I echo that because for years we went through those very lean years, especially back in uh, 08, 9, 10, 11, and uh, to see the, the Parks Department's ability to expand and uh, do you still have the night crew? We do. 
Great, great. Um, can you speak a little to the park ranges? Because I know, uh, you know, the friends groups that help support that actually help keep it sustained mm -hmm. through those rough years. And now, are we taking back a little more um, responsibility for that funding? Yeah, so uh, Dennis can answer the specific questions around the finances, so I'll turn that over to him, but I just, it would be helpful for me to talk philosophically the way the city mm -hmm. is approaching this. So there was a period of time where the park ranger program, but specifically uh, the mounted unit park ranger program, was for lack of a better term on the chopping block as far as whether or not the city would actually fund it. That's no longer the case. Uh, the city is funding the park ranger program. The city is participating in the funding around the mounted unit. And that is affording the opportunity, and I won't speak for them because they're actually present here so they can speak for themselves, but that is actually affording the friends group to go through a transition themselves where they will support the program, but they no longer have to worry about that baseline funding right. or else the program will be canceled. For a period of years, there was an MOA with the friends group that but for that funding being presented, the program would be eradicated. That is not the city's position right now. We recognize the value of this program. The mayor is very committed to the mounted unit. And so we're moving forward in a new era of the relationship with the friends group, where it's truly a partnership and not this situation where if they didn't fund this, this program would go away. Uh, right. Dennis, I don't know if there's... Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing I would add is the full-time position that Chris previously mentioned that's being added to the budget this year is for um, a stable operations type person. Mm -hmm. So that would allow somebody to be more dedicated to the stable and allow us to deploy other park rangers that are helping out around the stable more into the field. Great, and um, a parochial question. We have Boston calling this weekend mm -hmm. in uh, Harvard, the area Harvard Stadium. And I was wondering, uh, last year I saw some park rangers around, the, you know, um, trotting around the Charles River reservation area yeah. around that area. Could I, is that possible to happen again this year? If uh, it, yeah. So uh, I, I suspect they weren't our Rangers counselor, okay. but what I will do is I'll, I'll reach out to uh, our colleagues at, at, at DCR to see if it was, it probably if was, it was right. them. So what I'll do is I'll reach out to they them. They look and the same though. They do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, sus I suspect it wasn't our Rangers, uh, but I will check back on that. Uh, yeah. Just just to let you know that I know there was concern in the neighborhood about uh, whether there be any adverse effects on Smithfield, uh, yeah. especially with all the investments that the, mm -hmm. the city is, is, is making in Smith, as well as our partners with uh, Samuels and Harvard University and everyone else mm -hmm. participating. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't see any adverse effects at Smithfield from right. the, the festival last right. year. And but again, I'll, I'll check with DCR and make sure they have the appropriate coverage. Great. And thanks. And I look forward to phase two. And thanks for seeding that a little in this year's capital budget yeah. as well. Appreciate it. Um, again, to remind my colleagues, we're going to go to a hard five-minute stop because we're going to take public testimony after the first round. Uh, chair recognizes Councillor Baker. Is not here, so Councillor oh. O'Malley. <laughs> and I'm timing myself to show that I'm being <laughs> I'll do. Um, I'll do this. There you go. Uh, so uh, allow me to speak as quickly and efficiently as possible because I do want to hear from our dear park advocates. Uh, Dennis Roach, Billy Sitting, Mike Vidaro, Marcel Jockyard, Ryan's Wood, Commissioner, you've got all your team that's with you up there. You guys do amazing work. The Parks and Recreation Department has never operated as well as it is right now in my eight years on this body, and tremendous credit goes to you. Um, delighted to see the mayor's investment. I want to see that investment grow even more, so let's just tick through some things. Back to the Boston Parks Rangers unit. I want to see one more additional park ranger. <laughs> I think we need that. It is such an amazing program. Um, just particularly along the, the Emerald Necklace in my district and Councillor Zakem's district, can we get one more additional park ranger in this year's budget? So the, to answer that question, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't apologize to the city council and apologize to the budget office. Uh, when, when I first started, uh, Dennis and I were working hard on brainstorming on this project. And the way that I approached it the first several years was actually to look for uh, additional um, seasonal rangers uh, because I felt that what we needed was just a stronger presence and, and more bodies. What I, what I didn't realize at the time, uh, and I'm embarrassed as I've grown uh, not only a professional relationship but also a friendship with Chief Savillo who's, who's in charge of the park rangers work, and yeah. does, does great work is just how highly skilled these individuals are. 
And what often happens is through the training process of them becoming special police officers, they get trained, they go through the, the fairly rigorous, rigorous park ranger training as well as training as ambassadors of these spaces. And then the, because they've received this training, they become very welcome candidates for whether it's BHA police or other, uh, or you know, college campus police or actually the Boston Police Department themselves. So we have had a very high turnover rate for those seasonal rangers. I think working with the budget office uh, moving forward, um, I think what we'd like to do is look at some of that seasonal deployment that we have and look at is there an opportunity where we can translate that into FTEs. And of course that would have a major impact on the budget and has to be considered with everything that the city has to consider with FTEs. But uh, I just, yeah, I would just have to take responsibility for that emphasis in my first few years. And I think as we look forward, um, not to diminish the work of seasonal workers, but there's, there's nothing quite like an FTE. It gives someone the security to be in a position. Absolutely. Someone used the analogy, I'm not clever enough to come up with it, that it's like, you know, you don't keep, if you keep planting the same tree year after year, it's not going to be a mature tree. So it's great to have more people. So That's I'll right. continue to push for that. Um, sunscreen dispensers, are we all, how many are up? Yeah, so none are up, but this is the big weekend. So this is, this is the time to shine. So if you need protection in our parks, uh, the sunscreen dispensers go out this weekend. Uh, and how many will be going out? Uh, I believe seven, but I can double check okay. for you. And how the, much? New, the new location is La Presti in East Boston. Fantastic. And, how, and Jamaica Pond and Millennium Park, including those? Correct. Those. And how much are we spending on sunscreen? We're spending zero dollars. Zero dollars, Commissioner? That's right. Because of a generous <laughs> donation from Impact Melanoma. That's Thankful right. Thankful for them. And how much have we spent the last couple of years on that sunscreen? That would be zero dollars. Zero dollars. Thank That's you, right. Commissioner. <laughs> um, I'm at 3.30. Water filling stations, is that, are we, we're including more of those. I see them. I love them. Get rid of those plastic bottles. And are they the specs in all of our new parks yeah, as they're they, being they, built? We, we don't put in a, a water fountain unless it's in one of the historical parks and even the historical parks when we renovate the pathways we're installing the water fountain. Fantastic. Stations. Jamaica Pond Pathway Projects, we've had two public meetings. To, briefly the timeline on that. Uh, so we would be looking at a fall bid. Yep. Um, that's very ambitious. If the next couple of public meetings go well, then we could be on track for a fall bid, which would be looking at a spring construction. Fantastic. Yeah. Billings Field, love Billings. We need a little help. I see you there with your two beautiful daughters all the time. Yeah. Um, any investments in this year's budget for Billings Field? Uh, so Dennis, I don't know if you want to talk about the courts. Yeah, so um, there's, there's two factors. We, they are, it is part of our uh, court uh, renovation project so they will be going under the knife this fall to renovate the two basketball courts at the field but also that uh, baseball diamond that needs some work and love down there we have that as part of our ball field repair project we've started that project already and done some of the edges of the infield we'll be finishing that project this summer and fall in uh, regrading and restructuring the whole entire infield there so it'll almost look um, more like a brand new infield by, by this fall. Fantastic. I have 15 seconds, so I'll close with a statement. Councilor Presley and I are doing a hearing on sort of street tea, tree coverage and canopy coverage. Uh, I hope in this budget we can also include a better way to have a hard number, grow that, and make sure that we can continue to support the great work that you are doing. 459. Thank you all. <laughs> Good Thanks, job. Councilor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've since been joined by uh, City Councilors Michael Flaherty to my left. Councilor Kim Janey to my right, and Councilor Lydia Edwards back to my left. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Tim McCarthy. I love we have, we have a five minutes stop now. It's the last budget hearing. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Mark. Well done. You get two minutes now. <laughs> yeah, and, it was, and the mic's not even on. How many, how many, you control job, everything around here? Job, Cara. All right. Anyway. Um, thanks very much, Commissioner and team. Uh, very happy to have you guys here. I, I have no qualms about saying that the Parks Department is one of my favorite departments. I was there for eight years, and uh, I loved it when I was there. Um, the commitments uh, in District 5 were Almont Park, Reservation Road, um, all of the playgrounds that we've rebuilt in Rosendale. Um, it's really just, it's unbelievable. I'm very happy with the Walsh administration and the fact that, uh, that his administration is reestablishing itself as a capital plan, you know, capital plan based things you can see, things you can touch, things that keep families here. Um, the Mayor's Cup uh, hockey and, and baseball, um, I actually follow uh, Councillor Asabi George through her world, uh, through the hockey and baseball Mayor's Cup. Uh, my son actually uh, did some uh, scorekeeping and everything, and it's just uh, Billy Siddick does a really nice job, um, and everybody seems really happy. It's nice to meet kids from all over the nation, I mean all over the city, 
Um, I know that uh, when we were talking about it, I know we won the Mayors Cup a couple times in baseball when I was coaching, and they're really great memories, especially now that he's graduating tonight, I feel that uh, I'm actually old is really what, it's, what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> The baseball diamonds uh, look great. It's a noticeable difference um, between the parks. Do we have enough full-time employees? And, and how, many, how many slots do we have open and how many do we need? So, uh, Councillor, if you could find the one department head that would tell you that they have enough bodies. They um, all do. Yeah. They all do. Yeah. They smile. I was on the other side of the table when you say, oh, yeah, we have plenty. Yeah. <laughs> so w w what, I would, what I would say is that we have to be more strategic about how we deploy the work. Um, before we ask the taxpayers to, to reinvest into FTEs, we have to make sure that we are investing in the most efficient deployment of work. Um, one thing that we've done recently is uh, we've given uh, ball field management specifically to one individual, as general foreman, Gary Dwyer. He does extraordinary work, and I think that's made a big difference. Uh, before, we had a highly regional approach, and so there was discrepancies in equity in how those fields were taken care of. Um, so that's one thing that has been improved. We're now into the mowing season, and so what we'd be looking for is, are there is there a small investment in technology to make sure that we are mowing in a way that not only maintains the ball fields that we hear the most about, but also the ball fields that we don't hear the most about to make sure that there's some sort of equity in the way that we're, we're actually taking care of these parks. So I'd, I'd let Dennis talk a little bit about some of the technology that we're looking at for some of the deployment of vehicles. Yeah, so um, we are, um, we are in, in talks with Public Works who rolled out um, a highly advanced GPS software system that allows us to kind of track vehicles and things like that. But what it will also allow us to do is track our mowers. We can put GPS units on our particular mowers and we can see when the, when the, when the, um, when the mower hit the field, it could show you exactly the, the, the outline that it did and how long it took you to do that field. And that way you can, you, you can strategically deploy resources by how long it's taken to do each field, how often you need to do each field. And we're working very closely with Public Works and we're developing, like a, developing a pilot program which we hope to roll out this summer to test this type of software. Yeah. Well, one of the, um, the follow-ups on that is when you talk about is something happening that's different. If Gary Dwyer is aware of, and he's watching the 311 queue for the complaints and he's always working out the schedule, that frees up the district crews to actually take care of individual fields themselves. And so uh, the South End, the, excuse me, not the South End, the South Boston crew is currently taking care of M Street while the ball field crew is taking care of Moakley because it's such a large facility and it's such a burden just for the district crew. I think that's resulting in a better level of services at places like uh, Medal of Honor and some of the smaller fields in South Boston. Yeah. I think it's it, it come out great. I'm at 420, so I don't eat up any more of my time. Um, I do want to talk about the golf courses. Uh, both golf courses were listed uh, top 10 uh, in Massachusetts for municipal courses. That's a I mean, that's a huge feather in your cap. Um, Dennis Roach has been, you know, phenomenal with the whole George Wright, uh, you know, redesign and, and rebuilding of that uh, of that complex. Um, I played nine holes this morning at, at Franklin Park at 5:30 a.m., so I wasn't on the clock. Um, <laughs> my wife thinks she, I'm crazy, but anyway. Um, but I do want to say I've got like eight minute, eight seconds. But um, what I do want to say is uh, we had the High Park 150 uh, major kickoff. High Park is turning 150 years old. We had 250 people. Uh, in the George Wright Clubhouse, uh, a tent out on the, uh, on the <coughs> pavilion. A lot of it had to do with uh, Dennis's work. My mic wasn't turned off for 10 seconds. So um, <laughs> it was a great event. And I, I, the one thing I want to tell you is that when, uh, when I was walking the mayor around introducing, there, was, there had to be about 70% of the people that were at that event had never been inside the clubhouse because they believe it's a golf clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's a clubhouse for the people. And when the money, is sunk into that building, it's gonna be an integral part of High Park for the next 80 years. It truly is an 80 year investment and uh, I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to the Parks and Recreation Department for all the work you do. Um, I, we use the parks quite a bit and I know Councilor McCarthy uh, referenced Mayor's Cup uh, baseball last year and my boys team lost at um, a bad call at the plate. I'm very sorry to and, hear that. Um, we can. I'm really, <laughs> really, really sorry to hear that. <laughs> we can review the tape yep. any time you like. <laughs> so I'd like to question the uh, officials Absolutely. that are that are.
calling those games. Yeah. Um, and that will be something we'll talk about for the rest of our lives, I'm sure, <laughs> until we reclaim the cup uh, for Dorchester. Um, I do have some questions about permitting of our fields. How many, how many permits do we issue? Who are the groups that we're issuing them to? And are there any costs associated with those permits? Sure. No, it's a, it's a great question. I, I don't know if Dennis has the actual specifics on how many permits we issue, but if we don't have that right now, we can forward that to you. As far as the actual cost, currently there is zero cost to someone for pulling a permit. Now there might be some emotional cost in, in, the, in the tough days where you actually had to phone call or you had to fax something in, but now that it's all online, hopefully it's a little bit easier. Um, this was really our first full year of uh, using online reservation systems. Um, we had sort of softly rolled it out before. What we were finding is that the folks who are really good at using uh, computers um, have no problem with it, and folks that might have some trouble, it creates a barrier for them. So we're still, we're still seeing, although nowhere near the same amount of volume, we're still seeing people um, show up in person who need a little assistance uh, as far as permitting. As far as the groups, I can just talk about uh, permitting priority. Um, so first, the first thing that happens with any of our fields is we uh, schedule Boston Public Schools and we do that with their athletics office. After that, we allow um, the youth organizations to schedule youth sports. And after that, it's, it's whatever's left for adult leagues and other fields. Um, I don't know if the, it, is there something else. On yeah, the I mean, I can answer the numbers. Um, yeah. It's it's 5,100 permits roughly that we, we schedule in our parks every year. Um, that's up to quite a bit over the past couple of years. That's up to like 20, 30 percent over the past couple of years. There's more activity happening in our parks. I mean, that's everything from you know athletic events, road races, movies, concerts, weddings, rallies, those types of things. So um, we do have lists that we can provide the councils with you know who is permitting in our parks and how much they pay. Um, they do not pay a fee for the permit but um, they do pay, for, to pay lighting fees and things like that, so. Um, so any permit for any of these categories, especially the youth sports and the adult leagues and BPS, those are free permits? And then how do we coordinate with for-profit companies that rent or that permit our space? Yeah, it's, a, it's an area for us that we really have to get better at. So one of the things that we have before the budget office right now is we have a proposed uh, schedule of fees to look at, to look at specifically special events permitting. Um, when I was fortunate enough to be at the Arts, Tourism and Special Events office, we developed a fee structure for City Hall Plaza. And I would think especially for for-profit groups, but frankly, even for some non-profit groups that have large impact, you have, to, you have to judge them a little bit differently. If someone's gonna have a concert and there's gonna be sponsorships associated with that concert and 2,000 or 3,000 people are gonna show up at a park and have an impact on the park, they shouldn't be paying the same as the folks who live in the neighborhood and are using a baseball field as an amenity to, to get youth engagement in sports. So that's, that's an area that we look forward to partnering with uh, the law department and obviously the budget office. And of course, we would have to present that to the city council at some point. We certainly don't want to create a burden on youth sports. We don't want to create a burden on nonprofits, uh, strictly nonprofit serving youth. Um, but if there's large organizations that are using our parks for large um, events, we should probably receive some of that benefit. Yeah, I happen to be having a conversation this morning um, with a resident about that this hearing was happening today and, and asked specifically about the for-profits, a younger person who I know participates in some of that. And they're paying up to $80 to be members um, of some of these, you know, quote unquote, social organizations, but they're for-profit businesses using our space. If those, if those uses required the lights, which can be expensive, are we, tra are we charging for lights? Yeah, we, we, so if it's an adult league, we charge them for lights. And what's the charge for lights? Dennis, you know what I the don't have yeah, we, can, we can get back to that. There's an hourly charge, council. Great, thank you very much. No, thank Thanks. you. Councilor Zakem. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, just jump right into it because I see we have a very strict uh, taskmaster over there today. Um, uh, on the Rangers, um, 
I do appreciate uh, Commissioner and uh, Chief and the Mayor's commitment uh, to funding the park rangers at levels we have not seen uh, in the past, and it seems every year we do have more, and uh, it's much appreciated, but I do want to echo uh, you know, Councilor O'Malley's comments earlier, I know we'll hear from some of the Friends groups after this, about int how integral rangers are, not just to, I think, the safety uh, and security of our parks, but as ambassadors uh, for the city, uh, particularly in some of our downtown parks, uh, the Common, the Public Garden, um, the Com Ave Mall. Uh, you know, it's, it's much more approachable, I think, for, uh, for tourists, for visitors, whomever, when they see someone on the horse. Uh, it's a good interaction, I think, with the city. It's a good interaction with law enforcement. Um, so I would want to see uh, what more we can do on that. Can you, now I know we're at, we've added one position this year's budget. Can you tell me what the dollar amount is for that increase? That's roughly a $40,000 park ranger one level mm. funded job. And so for a second would be 40000 So that's to, to add that. How many full-time rangers do we currently have? There are 13 full-time rangers. Okay. And as mounted? Um, I don't know the breakdown. I think there's roughly six mounted mm. within that breakdown. Yeah, but I know the chief is, is training a couple of individuals right now, so we, could, we can mm. get that information back to you. Um, and are there plans, um, and I would say that this is certainly going to be one of, I think, something I would like to see um, in a resubmitted budget, if there is, the addition of at least one more uh, position there. I think, um, you know, we invest a lot in our parks. I think from a maintenance standpoint, from a capital standpoint, from operations, and making sure that they're secure and safe and welcoming um, is also a worthy investment. So uh, I would like to see the addition of another uh, permanent position. Um, do you have plans uh, moving forward to expand this force, or is this something we'll just continue doing? Uh? Well, again, the, the discussion that um again, I'll take ownership of is that instead of looking for more seasonal deployment, maybe maybe pursuing opportunities to look at translating that into full-time employees at some point. I think that's, I think that is an important step. Um, I know I, I agreed with you and I think everyone did that we thought seasonal would be a, a good approach to, and it's it clearly, um, I think best, despite best intentions and a real investment, um, you know, we, we realize we need to have permanent positions. So I, I would certainly want to see that. Um, I want to applaud you for the one new position in this budget. Would like to see a second, um, something uh, I think we really can uh, find there. Um, and then just quickly, um, I know uh, as Winthrop Square development moves forward, um, there's going to be a lot of funds for, you know, parks in general, but I know the Common, the Public Garden, uh, and Franklin Field. Uh, how are we doing on, uh, on planning for that spending? I know a lot of it's contingent on sales and permits being sure. granted, that sort of thing. So we, we actually, if you look at the, the budget, uh, the mayor has allocated, uh, regardless of when the Winthrop Square money would arrive, has allocated funds for the master plan to start both at Boston Common and also at Franklin Park. So we have $500,000 roughly for Boston Common, $800,000 for Franklin Park. Uh, the reason the amounts is that the uh, Boston Common is really going to be a unifying of a lot of different plans that already exist. Frankly, a lot of those plans that have been developed by the, our partners, the Friends of the Public Garden. So it's really just trying to create sort of a unifying theory among all these different plans that have sort of evolved over the, the years. Uh, we're developing the RFP uh, in concert with the Friends of the Public Garden. They're going to participate in the decision-making process. And then also we're going to be taking that out to the community. So we're, we're looking to release that RFP uh, this summer, um, have designers on board, start the community process in September, and revitalizing the common and hopefully with early investments next year. Great. Well, I, uh, I look forward to that, and I do, um, just before I end this, I feel that I am running low on time. I just want to thank you for your partnership with the Friends Groups. I know that the Friends Groups I work most with are the Friends of the Public Garden, the Friends of the Mounted Park Rangers, and um, I think despite sometimes having uh, slight disagreements uh, on some of these issues, particularly, you know, around priorities, which is completely natural. I know you've been a great partner. I know you'll, we'll probably hear from uh, some of the representatives who I see here um, from those organizations, and I appreciate that work and the administration's support. And, and like you said, seeing a higher parks budget uh, every year is, is certainly exciting. I just wish we could get it even a little higher, maybe $40,000 higher this year for another ranger. But uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, Chief, your teams. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Councilor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Council Siomo, and I uh, just want to reiterate what Council Azakum mentioned. I also represent um, some of the Boston Common, and I'd also love to see um, 
more, more services for the, more funding for park rangers. Um, thank you to you and thank you to the mayor for that great program. Um, as it relates, I know we talked to Commissioner several times about um, M Street Park in the past. Sure. I know you've been up there recently. Um, the staff from the parks are doing a good job there. It's just something that we just need to continue to focus on and stay on top of. Absolutely. Um, and the basketball court itself needs some work. Um, and the, um, the, the outfield also needs some work too, but if we could stay on top of that. Absolutely, Councillor. I, I have to say that, um, and it was actually um, because your staff brought me out there, that basketball court is the worst basketball court that I've seen in my four years since I've been there. So we're gonna be addressing that with a quick fix with some of our GPI funds that are available to us, but we'll also be addressing it with our various courts program, I believe in this fall, if not it the is, spring. Yes. So. Th yeah, thank you, yeah. Commissioner. Um, also, Moqui Park, I know that's a major focus uh, of the mayor, the administration, and yourself. Um, same thing with the, with the Little League fields and the Babe Ruth field. If we could get some attention um, to, those, to those parks as well. I know, I know you are trying, so mm -hmm. we, we do appreciate what, what you're trying to do there. No, we are. We're working hard on it. Uh, we'll continue to do better. I think the most important thing that um, yourself and certainly Councilor Flaherty over the past few years as well has made a priority for us is the importance of actually communicating to the users who use it the most. Um, for a long time, there's been a disconnect for whatever reason between the community members and the Parks Department. And so things that um, could have easily been solved and remedied very quickly by our maintenance crews would go unaddressed. Those connections have been made now, hopefully, and will continue to grow those. So one thing that we did is uh, Charlie Rideout, who's our superintendent for Dorchester and Mattapan. He used to have all the way from Mattapan through Dorchester all the way up to South Boston. We created a new dis district uh, superintendent for the South End and South Boston, and that's Chris Neff. Chris Neff grew up in those, uh, those parks in South Boston, so we think that that'll lead to better communication between some of the residents of some of those fields. In addition, by him picking up the South End and South Boston, that should actually ease the burden on Lincoln Phillips, mm -hmm. who is our district superintendent for, um, for Roxbury. So that's giving him less parks to, to look at. So hopefully that results in uh, better delivery services. Thank you, Commissioner. And going into, I'll save the South End for the next round, but just quickly on, on Chinatown, we have the um, Suhu Park, Taitung Village. We, we have small parks in Chinatown. We don't have enough space. Um, I was in conversation many times with the Rose Kennedy Greenway uh, people. I wanna make sure the park um, in the Chinatown section looks as nice as the Rose Kennedy Greenway in downtown Boston. But I'd love to have you help to make sure we stay on top of the Greenway people to make sure that you know the, the Greenway in, in, in Chinatown looks beautiful also. Um, also, we're getting to Miri Suhu Park and Taitung Village, a little park there. Overall, what can we do in Chinatown to improve space, um, make, it, make it easier for kids to enjoy, for the elderly to enjoy? There's not enough space, but long term, we need to do something about Chinatown. So when you look at open space in a, in a location that's fully built out like Chinatown, there's, there's two inherent problems. One is, okay, where's the next park gonna be because there's not space for park? And then it's, okay, what can the existing parks be, right? So when you have an opportunity, it's important to really look at an aggressive program. And so uh, I know it's not Chinatown proper, but the edge of Chinatown, when you look at Elliott Norton Park, and the opportunity there to put in a lot of innovative programming and uh, as well as some ecological value with the bioswale that we have in there that Youth Build actually helps us maintain, uh, as well as the Friends Group, the Friends of Elliott Norton Park. I think you have to look at what, what solutions are provided by program in some of those spaces. When you look at something like Tai Tung, Tai Tung's by far um, the smallest tot lot that we have in the city of Boston. Right. It's, it's very, very small. There's not a lot of additional program there. So then we have to really look at non-traditional spaces. And there are a lot of, a little, a lot of kids in that area too. There's a, there's a ton of amount of kids. So then you have to look at the non-traditional spaces and you have to look at the Parks and Recreation Department being a partner, not just on the parks and open space side, but also on the recreation division. So when we look at free events and can you take plazas over on Saturdays and Sundays and mm -hmm. is there programming? And you see that in a place like Chinatown, 
that boy, it, it really needs it. And when you look at a basketball court that automatically becomes a volleyball court, that automatically becomes a basketball court, I think it represents an opportunity for, for innovative programming and strategy. And, and one more shout out just to the Greenway. When that was originally designed, that, their little portion, no one ever dreamed that there would be a playground feature there. And it was just through a pilot program that they put in the little tot lot feature that's there now. Well, God help them, they're never gonna be taking out a playground out of there because those kids need a place to play. So whether or not they renovate that, I'm telling you, there'll always be a playground feature in that space. So I think as, uh, I, I wanna be respectful of, of time as well, Mr. Chair, but I get excited because it's, it's, a, it, it's not an easy solution, but it, it's one worth w working towards. No, thank you, Commissioner. I, I, I wanna see that tot lot in the Greenway improve, though. I know it's the Greenway's responsibility, but I'm not all that impressed with it. I think they have to do some more work on it. I, so I, I, I think, uh, the only thing I would say is I'm excited it exists okay. and, and that it originally wasn't, uh, it wasn't intended to be there and the fact that there, there's a way for kids to participate in that landscape is exciting. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Councilor Siomo, and, and thank you for um, allowing for some public testimony in between. Um, applaud you for that, so thank you very much. Um, and Commissioner Cook, your chief, your incredible team, some of whom are sitting here and over here and also many of whom aren't here, um, thank you. We, in my office, and I speak for not just myself, my team members as well, Parks Department is one of the best. Um, whether I'm sitting somewhere randomly on a Saturday and I get a message about cleaning something up and I shoot you a text and literally in a couple of hours the park is clean, it's done. So thank you for being a partner in the work. I truly appreciate you and your team members. Um, I forgot to start my clock. Um, I will be quick since we have five minutes. Um, Early on, since taking on this new role, met with a group of advocates, some of whom are here and will probably uh, testify about the Boston Common Master Plan um, and seeking $500,000 to do that. Do you have that? And if so, great. If not, where is it? We do. We have it, and it's, uh, it's represented in this budget. And what that will enable us to do is uh, no matter when the Winthrop funds actually arrive into our budget, that's not going to delay the, the planning process awesome. on this. Um, the uh, Harambe Park, mm -hmm. um, there's additional funding for phase two? Phase, phase two, correct. Um, is it fully funded? Is there still, where are we with that? All right, so Harambe is amazing, right? Yep. So it's an extraordinary space. It's 45 acres. It's almost as big as Moakley. It, it represents a tremendous opportunity, especially with this JCC next to Franklin Field. Mm -hmm. We have an extraordinary uh, capital invest, investment represented in this budget here. That mm -hmm. represents a phase two budget. We're in construction for phase one right now. Mm -hmm. Phase two, we're gonna set priorities with the community to implement the master plan that we already did. But I do want to say that I think it's an opportunity that we need to look at philanthropic partners because when we are done with phase two, we'll still have a, an enormous amount of acreage left. Liza, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to the park design. But. Well, we're hoping with phase two that we'll be able to implement the soccer field mm -hmm. um, and extend the main park pathway, add lighting, so it'll be a true extension of phase one. Um, and Liza, thank you for your work on this too. Yeah, this you're is welcome. fantastic. And we're also applying for an additional park grant for phase two to supplement that budget. We won't know, um, of course, if we until we get the grant that we got it. But that would help us stretch that budget further and be able to do more. And as I always tell the commissioner, if I can write letters of support, whatever I can do, um, it's just fantastic. And it goes to this equity that we're always talking about in every in every service, but particularly our green spaces and making sure neighborhoods Dorchester, Mattapan are getting these capital improvements. And this is a big one, probably not celebrated enough for what it will eventually become. So thank you guys for your work and advocacy. Um, I'm looking at my timer here. Um, the $50,000 burial fund, what's happening with it? Are we talking to... Tina, what are we doing with that? Yeah, and thank you. No, well, uh, uh, Councillor. And the uh, mayor as well. Yeah, I'd say, uh, so the, the mayor and the city council deserve, uh, as well as the budget office, deserve all the credit on this. Um, it was not uh, an easy process to figure out um, how we yeah. would actually address this complicated issue, and it's certainly something that's definitely out of the bailiwick of the 
the Parks and Recreation Department mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the specifics and, and how that relationship's gonna work, I'll actually turn it over to Dennis Roach to speak. Thanks, yeah, Dennis. so we are in the, uh, the final phases of um, developing an MOA with the Peace Institute. Um, there are, the MOA is all signed. It's going through City Hall right now for final approval in order to pay the funds for the previous year, which is FY18. So that those funds exist, they're ready to be transferred over, they'll be transferred over in the next two or three weeks. Uh, and the funds do exist in the budget for next season as well. So this is a three-year agreement that the city's Great. committed to. So, and, and it's a three, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a three-year uh, signed MOA as well. So it, it, it's all ready to be finalized. Awesome, thank you guys um, mm -hmm. so much for your work and my colleagues as well for supporting this. This was a joint effort um, as well as the mayor. And I, I understand it's, it's new, but it's, it's um, important work, so thank you very much. And my last question is, and I have, I'm looking at my time, um, has to do with um, all the work you're doing in Rosendale with Mount Hope and, and my, my Rosendale folks at Mount Hope. Um, I love them dearly. We sometimes go back and forth, but there is ev n never love loss. Um, but particularly with the Mount Hope Cemetery um, Community Preservation Act, frankly, when talking about why this, the CPA is a good thing for the city, the Mount Hope Cemetery is often something I would point to. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you guys have done some things here and there, um, but I'm, I'm assuming that the level of work necessary, the fountain and all that, would probably be best when talking about CPA, a potential CPA proposal or something else. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, okay. You know, I think when we look at Mount Hope, and you're absolutely right, when, when we're looking at our capital budget and, you know, the opportunities for investment. It's very difficult not to prioritize active recreation that affects youth. You know, so that's why Harambee rises to the top because you just think about how many kids can actively be playing there. But then you look at the what happens to our facilities, our historical facilities like Mount Hope, if they suffer through years of neglect by not investing in capital. So the idea that it could be preservation, and frankly, because the neighborhood is growing in density, mm -hmm. that people actually do use this cemetery as open space, they go for walks there, they take their dogs through there, all the things that, that does have a lot of high value on the preservation end. So thank you, and we'll, yeah. we'll stay in conversation on that. Um, and I support the additional park ranger, I think we're all gonna say that because they are advocating and power to those advocates. Thank you, Councilor Sioma. Thank you. Councilor Wu. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to start with, so echoing so many folks' comments about the great work that you all do, and um, it's, you know, there's not a part of the city where people aren't um, so attached to their, their beloved local park, and there's so many favorites that I've been able to enjoy with my kids, um, so really see up close the tangible work and, and how much goes into that. Um, could we start with Urban Wilds? Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, curious how, what's the plan? I see there's some funding. Um, now and sure. kind of over the next couple of years? So uh, as, as far as the capital plan, yeah. Councilor, yeah. So every year we receive an allocation uh, for capital funding for Herbal Wilds. Um, what I would say is over the past several years, a lot of that has been focused on a few individual properties just because they're so large. So Allendale Woods took up a lot of the appropriation for about a year and a half of the allocation. And then we are also able to to uh, team up with a, a partnership grant uh, for Sharon Woods for some strategic investments. Now we're moving into uh, a cycle where we can start again making smaller investments in multiple properties. Dennis, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add is that the $350,000 capital allocation that you mentioned, it is also supplemented in the fund for parks by grants that we receive for Urban Wilds. So that capital allocation actually expands itself out to four, five, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000, depending on the year and the grant that we get, so. And we're more than happy, Councilor, to, to follow up with the exact breakdown for the upcoming okay. FY19. Great, perfect. Yep. I mean, particularly in um, the area that Councilor Campbell was just talking about, there's a there's a lot of need and, and interest. Um, so, speaking of external grants, what is the um, how, what is the internal kind of mechanism or or staffing to help go after these? And do you think there's more out there that if there if you had more staff to be able to focus on that, that the city could 
keep building up? I think there's a lot of opportunity, but again, we have to make sure that we're maximizing all the opportunities that we have. So we have a very, very hardworking staff on uh, raising funds, and the vehicle that we use is actually the fund for Boston Parks and Recreation. Uh, it was actually uh, established in Mass General Laws, so we have state en enabling uh, legislation to develop the nonprofit. Um, so we do have this nonprofit vehicle that we can raise funds for specific parks and recreation, um, whether it's capital work or operating funds to augment the budget. Is it separate staff for the nonprofit? No, or? it's not a separate okay. staff counselor. So what we use is we actually, under the direction of our director of external uh, affairs, Ryan Woods, uh, we have a development director, um, Maureen McQuillan, and she uh, she organizes many of our are asked whether it's corporate philanthropy or if it's nonprofits or if it's national grant making. In addition to that, on the on the capital side, uh, under direction of Eliza Meyer, we have Aldo Guerin who applies for most of our traditional um, park grants, whether that's from National Park Service or other groups. Um, and so. Uh, we have a team that focuses on the traditional uh, sources of park funding, federal, state, uh, and major nonprofit partners, as well as folks that focus on corporate philanthropy. But to answer your question, is there more we can do? Th there is more we can do. I mean, I do believe that there's a universe out there that would support Boston Parks, and so it really is on us, again, before we go back to the taxpayer for for more positions and for more capital work, it, it behooves us to actually concentrate on, on that capacity. Do you feel like in this current political environment at the federal level that's having any impact on our traditional external funding? Oh, I apologize, Councillor. I was reading something while you were talking. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, 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 sorry, my fault. <laughs> sorry, no, it's uh, my fault. I, uh, I was just saying, I, do you feel like- I can so pretend that I heard your question, but I didn't. <laughs> So you kind of broke it down into separate categories of philanthropy, private sector, right. and then traditional federal government, right. et cetera. Does the current federal administration's sort of, anyway, does that whole situation affect anything for no, Boston it, Parks? It, it's a great question, and it's one that we won't know. I mean, I think you're probably hearing this from a lot of different advocacy groups that the way those grant cycles work is you're, you're given the grant and then you almost receive the money two or three years later on a reimbursement cycle. So we haven't really been in that cycle to see if the climate's gonna affect us yet. Um, one of the things that we really are grateful for is our partnership, uh, not only with the budget office, but the uh, Office of Intergovernmental Affairs and everything they will, is, is especially with the Director of Strategic Partnerships to see are there groups that we haven't been approaching that we can now approach, so. great. Yeah. Um, did you want to say something, Chief, too? Or yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry I forgot to set a timer, so I hope Mr. Chair will just cut me off whenever. It's five. Okay. All right. <laughs> Next round. Shouldn't have asked. <laughs> I, I didn't give you my warning, so I apologize. We'll stop being honest with each other and we could keep talking. So. Council Flaherty. <laughs> sorry. Been commissioning your team. Uh, I'd like to know actually what happened to the chief's hand, uh, but I only have five <laughs> minutes, so I'll get it offline, but hope you're feeling a little better. Uh, yeah, it's a short but story. Good. You've got a great team, uh, and obviously I speak to my uh, interactions with both the commissioner and, and Dennis, um, and um, you know whether you call them on a late Friday night or a first thing Monday morning, they're super responsive. Uh, they immediately jump on whatever the issue is, and the issue is more often than not, it, it's parks related, and it's, 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 um, and it's important to the person that's calling, so they're, very, very responsive and very respectful uh, of, of this body, which we appreciate. And we're, it, it's a, it seems like it's truly a shared partnership. So, um, and I think they can both attest to the number of times I've reached out in the day or the hours that I'm reaching out and um, they don't shy away from a tough conversation or a tough phone call. So that's testament to, to, um, to our mayor and the team that he's put together as well as uh, your, your team chief. So. Um, Commissioner, maybe just touch base on uh, staying just maybe on, um, well, let me first say that I'll uh, echo and reiterate my support as the longest serving councilor to, to park ranges. It's, uh, it's a great program that we have. We'd love to see more of them. We also would love to see our mounted unit from the Boston Police Department back. That's a conversation for a different department, but uh, they add tremendous value um, on a number of fronts, uh, from a PR front to a public safety front. Um, so I'd, I'd echo that um, as well as, um, the need to, to maybe focus on our arborist and, and give them a little bit more attention um, in terms of just uh, the tree pruning piece of this, but also in the tree planting piece of this. So they have a daunting task and uh, might be time to have a discussion about maybe increasing um, 
their, their manpower and capacity. I um, want to just talk about the landscaping crews because it, it's my understanding just from dealing with the issues that you and, and I and Dennis talk about is that is there, there's only one landscaping crew citywide. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, for, for ball fields, I mean, there, there's multiple crews that actually, you know, mow the grass and it depends on uh, the level of care that a certain park needs, right? So that if you're looking at a, a small little park that you're just getting with a 22 inch uh, push mower, that would be the district crew. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're looking at the large mowing operation, yeah, there's only one crew that goes around the city and actually deals with large mowing. And sort of giving obviously the in anticipated CPA funds and the anticipated mitigation from Winthrop Square. Clearly we're in a great position as a city uh, to really kind of take what you do and what your team does to a, a whole different level, I think. Uh, our parks and a lot of our playgrounds and ball fields, they're the jewel of, of our city and I think we have a real good opportunity here with that type of investment uh, to kind of really uh, hit the throttle on that stuff. So whether, it, so I guess, so, and maybe this for Dennis is the, so we sort of, um, we probably react, or at least I'm calling and we're deploying staff kind of, I guess, directly to fields under certain situations. I, I think I called you last year, the, the city was hosting like the district final right. championship and the parents and the visiting team got down to the field and it was a disaster. That's right. And then you guys had to sort of deploy mowers and scrapers and shovelers and line yeah. crews. Well, Everyone right. had to sort of deploy right there. So is that, from a management's perspective, is that sort of is that the best way we should be tackling? No, counselor, it's it's inefficient as as yeah. you would guess, and so that's sort of the hope with some of this technology and some of the innovation that we'd be looking at is, you know, are we are we getting these uh, on the 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 amount of times a week and in the amount of times a month we should be getting? Now, what that doesn't factor in, what technology doesn't factor in, is uh, is is weather events, right? So maybe they get there. Um, it doesn't factor in when someone's double parked in front of a park and we got to wait for BTD mm -hmm. to, to move them along so we can actually get the large mower into the park. That being said, uh, it is certainly not efficient and it's not the best use of the city's resources to just be reacting to emergencies. So the idea is to get to um, a proactive management plan for all of these spaces and what that's going to require is going to require some strategic conversations about okay, where where do we use contracts and where do we deploy our, our workers? Because there's certainly enough wor workers for our ecosystem. So currently, East Boston Stadium, um, as well as the uh, the um, as as well as um, as well as Millennium Park in West Roxbury, we use contracted services mm -hmm. there. Now, uh, the reason we do that is there's such large they're such large fields, uh, and I was going long, so that shouldn't cut into his He's, time. Filib he's filibusting here. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a yes or no answer. Yeah. out the clock. That was a yes the or no answer, answer. The answer is no, it's not efficient, but no. we're getting better every right. day. And then from this, and when, so and when employees, whether, I don't know, you break the city into districts or divisions, mm -hmm. is, is it still my understanding that, say, you're, wherever you live in the city, you drive to the site, <laughs> yeah. and then you get in your truck, and then you drive all the way back, like so, from a time management perspective. Yeah. So does it make sense from a, a, a parks to recreational employee from East Boston, have to get in the car, come through the tunnel, go and check in at the common. Hey, right. I'm here and I'm, I've reported for duty, clock's running, now they gotta turn back around again. Can we have a situation where, where our employees are, are, are going to directly to That's the right. sites, then the clock starts. We waste a tremendous amount of time on Columbia Road and in That's the tunnels. Right. And, zigzagging all over the city. Could we have a situation from a management perspective where the employee actually reports to the site, um, or and if not, why not? We can. That's, I'm done. So the, no, no, the answer is that we can, and that we've already implemented a few examples of that. So for instance, we do have report, uh, employees reporting to East Boston Stadium. We think there's an opportunity with the Ollie building at Moakley mm -hmm. to have South Boston report there using some of the basic technology that Municipal Protective Services uses as far as the cards and the key in, mm -hmm. key out. Um, what we'll have to do is we'll have to, you know, there'll have to be oversight and management of the foreman yep. to make sure that there, right. there's, there's nothing happening. But most of our people are really good people and they just yep. want to get to work. Um, they don't want to be in the traffic for an hour. The other great opportunity that we have is Cassidy Fieldhouse in, uh, in Brighton. Uh, when we renovate that Fieldhouse, we believe that'll be the home of the Alston Brighton crew. Okay, good. great. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank my colleagues for going over a little bit. Thank you. Councilor Janey. Mr. Chair, and thank you for all your work. I'll just echo the praise. I um, also want to give a shout out to Lincoln for his amazing work uh, this morning. A couple of quick questions. Um, so 
last weekend, I think it was, I had the honor of joining with veterans and, and community leaders uh, over at B2. We were going to do the parade, and this was around um, just celebrating some of the veterans in our community, um, but also people are very proud of what is happening with the Justice Gordine uh, Veterans Memorial Park. If you could just um, walk me through very briefly where we are in that process. That's right. Uh, Liza is actually the expert on it, so I'll have Liza okay. take you through it. Finished the um, conceptual design of the park renovations uh, just a little less than a year ago, um, and we now have funding in our FY19 budget to take that conceptual design through construction documents, final design, and construction. And is that and the seven hundred thousand? That's right. Okay. And then the um, the artwork that will become the memorial in the park that. Um, received a substantive Brown Fund grant this year, and they're doing their final fundraising to be able to put all of the memorial design into fabrication. And so is that the Friends group that's doing that? Is that is the Friends, and Veterans and Friends of Right, and how much is, is needed to get us to the desired amount? The gap in the art funding, I believe, is around $350,000. Okay. Wonderful. Um, on the South End Library Park, um, can you just tell me where we are with that? Sure. So we opened up bids, I believe, last week. Yeah. I think last week we opened up bids. The bids actually came in uh, $100,000 higher than what we had actually anticipated. And so how is that going to impact the project? Because I think residents are really concerned that it's stalling the project. Yeah. It, well, it, it could. But what it does mean is we have to have a discussion with the budget office. So the first thing you do is you say, was there something inherently wrong with what the designer was putting out to bid? So we have to go through that part. Uh, then you start a conversation about is there value engineering that takes place here? Is there something, was there some choice of material that probably wasn't the right choice of material? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you just have to make sure that it, it was actually competitive bids. Um, we're fully committed to South End Library Park and those renovations. Uh, you probably know it's a unique partnership between us and the Boston Public Library. So we'll be working with the budget office on a solution. Dennis, I don't know. If and, and so that process, how long do you think that is going to take in terms of reviewing? Oh, we're, we're scheduled to meet with budget this week on okay, it. Okay. Well, I apologize next week. And I'm certainly going to advocate that this uh, move forward. So I think yeah. that is important. Um, I was wondering, so I know I'm not timing, so please uh, stop me. Okay. Um, I know you're working on the mulch issue uh, in, in Gertrude House Playground yes. from the Love Your Block, so yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. I want to point out that the pile is getting smaller and smaller, and at any day now, I'm expecting a neighbor to just put up a free mulch <laughs> sign. So if it's not gone soon, that's probably what's going to it happen. It was supposed to be gone two weeks there. ago. There, yes. Yeah. I know you're working on it, but yeah. it is getting smaller, just FYI. Yeah. So. Um, I don't want us to lose <laughs> the mulch yep. that the city has. In terms of needle disposal, um, how much is being invested in that? And I know this has been discussed sure. in some earlier hearings. Sure. So, um, well, it would be difficult for us to tease out how much is being invested in it because a lot of it is just manpower. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a, a fairly significant amount of our maintenance crew's time uh, checking spaces for needles. Um, crews have to be very vigilant about spaces that they didn't have to be before. So mm -hmm. I think for us, it quantifies into manpower time more than anything else. As far as actual- How much um, would you say in the manpower time that we're dedicating that in terms of dollars um, or, I, and or hours? You, you know, it, uh, Councillor, it, it would be very, it would, it would almost be irresponsible for me to guess, but what I would say is this. It was not abnormal uh, for a parks crew to slow down take a look into a park, see if it was really, really messy and whether or not they could get to the messy one and then maybe come back to that park before. We really can't afford to do that. So now crews should be getting out of their vehicles and looking through some of these make spaces just to make sure that they're safe. So when you start thinking about that, um, it potentially could add up. Yeah, and I want to, um, I have a couple more questions that I'll say for the second round around Carter's Playground and Franklin Park. Um, but I do want to say thank you for your responsiveness around snow removal. I know we've had lots of conversations around making sure that parks uh, in, in Roxbury uh, in particular, but other parts of my district, Dorchester South End, are, are being well maintained in terms of snow removal. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Edwards. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say thank you again for all your work in East Boston, Charlestown, and the North End. 
And so um, I just started at the time, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I guess it timey, anyway. Um, so I just wanted to ask a couple bi uh, big, big picture questions yeah. and then I'll get down to the parks in my district. Um, in terms of CPA funding, sure. um, do you, does your budget account for a certain percentage of projected funds to come in at all? No, it doesn't. And uh, sort of from an ethical standpoint, we, we kind of can't, right? Because the, the whole um, baseline premise of CPA is that it, would, it wouldn't replace existing capital funds. Okay. And so we've been very diligent about the projects that uh, we've applied for mm -hmm. not existing in our capital budget. Um, the only asterisk I'll put on that is that we do have projects that could benefit from additional funds. Right. And so we have applied for things like add alternates when bids come in high. So when you look at a project like um, Westland Avenue Gates in the Fenway, um, we could benefit from C CPA funds there to do work that we wouldn't normally be able to do with the mm -hmm. existing budget. So I, and I ask about CPA funding and also, um, you know, we mentioned kind of the private public partnership. Yeah. We have a lot of friends of such and such park, friends yeah. of, you know, whatever. And my concern is that when you have the CPA funding and the uh, capability to apply for that funds, plus you have a, maybe an active friends of whatever park, there's a certain amount of equity that might end up bolstering some parks way beyond other parks. And I just wanted to know how you're compensating or is that on your on your radar right now, making sure we have equity in our parking? Oh our yeah, parks. I mean if there's, so if there's a three-legged stool of the parks department, it's access, equity, and excellence, right? Mm -hmm. And we can't trust ourselves to just be the moral arbiters of equity. You know, we can't keep it all in our heads and we can't make the best decisions. Data can help us make those best decisions. And so when we develop our capital budget, we work with the city council, we work with the mayor's office, we work with the budget office, but we also work off actual scores mm -hmm. for our parks. And so we have a park inspection program that translates into a score, that translates into a sheet. And then if the, if the number is low, we go out and inspect that park and we deem whether or not it's worthy of capital investment. You're absolutely right. Sources of funding should not be drivers as to what parks get renovated. Right. It should be what parks deserve to be renovated. Thank you. So just going into then the parks in my district, um, I'm just curious about the timeline for Noise Park. You sure. testified already about it. We're very excited about it. We've actually been here at the table for expecting something to happen at Noise Park, and it's been delayed to. It has. So tell me when when. Again, when are the shovels going in? So this is uh, just as depressing as the South End Library Park talking point. We had the bid opening. We were very excited about it, and the bids came in $600,000 higher than what we actually have budgeted for the park, even with the external funds. And so now, uh, very quickly, we're going to begin the process with the budget office to see if there was something inherently wrong with the design. Do we have the opportunity to rebid? But we're fully committed to getting into construction uh, this fall. Uh, we don't want to lose any more playing time in East Boston, uh, especially with uh, it, it would be it would be very disastrous to lose another season of soccer and softball in East Boston. So we want to make sure that we do that. In addition, our poor maintenance crews who have been trying to mm -hmm. maintain noise at a fairly high level, they've been anticipating this infusion. So I think if we don't get noise going, uh, the maintenance crews in East Boston are going to revolt against me. So. <laughs> Um, switching over to the North End, uh, we had a meeting, I think, on win uh, Monday where um, we were presented design concepts for the Langone and Pupalo Park. Yeah. And um, thank you for looking at the resiliency, looking at how we're going to design those parks. But I think one of the biggest questions was really about synthetic versus sure. real uh, grass. It seems your department is assisting on the, on the turf, or the synthetic turf, and I don't know, is there a better option? There, there's, there's a lot of folks who are debating that. Yeah, I, I, listen, I think it's the kind of thing that we should I have. I have 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's I do, I, I really do. That okay. was okay. the 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so. We're on the same clock so, anyway. Okay. So because it's, because it's 30 seconds, uh, what I will say is that we, we look at it as the ability to what gets the most kids playing the most, right? And so you look at a waterfront park, you look at the conditions that that field is normally in, you look at the 
the, the brunt it takes from winter storms, that field is never going to be ready for Little League opening day in quality condition that other parks in the city will be unless it's artificial turf. Um, as far as safety concerns and things like that, we'd be happy to meet with any groups who are, who are concerned about it. Um, we understand that there's a lot of dialogue. Uh, we, 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 we haven't had any links to any safety concerns regarding the turf. Mm -hmm. We've looked at all those articles. We still feel that it's the safer option because what it does is it makes the field level, it makes the, the field a consistent playing surface. That actually prevents more injuries than when there's a poorly maintained natural field there. And, and because of the location, it would be very, very difficult for us to maintain little league and soccer fields there. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, now we're gonna go to half of the folks signed up for public testimony. So when I call your name, uh, if you wanna come down to that podium, uh, and some folks didn't check the yes box, but I'm gonna call your name anyway. Alicia Zip, Annette Bourne, Diane Appel Kassler are the first three names. All right, good morning. Good morning. Well, afternoon now. Um, my name is Alicia Zip. I live in Dorchester, and I'm on the steering committee of the newly formed Friends of the Boston Schoolyards. Uh, we will be advocating for the school department and the city to commit to supporting the funding necessary so that these beautiful green spaces throughout the city will be maintained for the benefit of our neighbors as well as our students. As you know, the schoolyards are an integral part of the parkland in the city, not only for teaching and learning, but also for the neighborhoods. So it is vitally important that the city supports schoolyards, parks, and other green spaces with their budgetary choices and priorities. Uh, as I believe most of you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent over the last 20 years in a public-private partnership to improve, revitalize, and transform the BPS schoolyards. Uh, during part of that time, environmental education was also an integral part of the science curriculum, and our students greatly benefited from the opportunity to learn directly in nature. We cannot allow these amazing resources, the schoolyards, to be neglected, not only for the good of our students, but also for our friends and neighbors who use these parks, as well as the larger parks, as a respite from the concrete jungle. Uh, we are lucky to live in a city like Boston, which actually has a lot of park space, but I don't think we can take it for granted. Uh, in the bigger picture, these spaces and the flora found there are also doing their part to help protect us from the ravages of climate change. I just wanted to mention that I read yesterday that Mayor Walsh had just announced a three-year partnership uh, between the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, the Trustees of Reservations, and TD Bank. Uh, to expand the reach and highlight the role of community gardens in Boston's neighborhoods. Many of the schoolyards are also considered community gardens. Uh, so we hope that you will do everything in your power to advocate, especially for the schoolyards, which I haven't heard mentioned at all. I know, um, you know, they're sort of a off in the distance, but they are parks, and people use them as parks, and we need to treat them that way as well. I do have... Um, a handout that I can give to you guys as well. Thank you so much for Thank your time. You. Now I'd like to recognize uh, Christine Poff is here representing the CPA committee. Hi, I'm Annette Bourne, and um, I can, s being one of the original members of the, uh, the uh, incentive to, to save the horses where the alternative would have been motorcycles. Um, it's been a wonderful program. I'd like to see it continue. It not only brings humaneness to the park, to the visitors, it's, it's a tremendous uh, incentive for them to uh, go around the parks, feel safe and, and enjoy them. And also they serve a ceremonial uh, uh, it's a duty, which I think is, again, for the people who are being honored or whatever for these ceremonial duties, it's very important. So, and I second what my predecessor said. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Diana Kassler, and I'm a resident uh, of the Back Bay. And 
I frequent the Commonwealth Mall and the gardens and, and uh, the common quite often. But I occasionally see the horses on the Commonwealth Mall, particularly and in the common. And my experience in watching them is that I'm awed by them, but also have seen small children coming along and just looking at those horses and being amazed. And, um, and they also have such a presence for uh, safety as well. So I'm very glad to hear that we'll be adding uh, another ranger. Uh, and I would uh, also support the idea of adding still, uh, still a second new ranger, but to um, specifically ask that they be trained as mounted rangers, not simply just rangers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jan Waldman, Michaela Waldman, and Pat Alvarez. Dear chairs and council members, my name is Michaela Waldman and I'm a former volunteer of the Boston Park Rangers Mounted Unit. On behalf of the Mounted Unit, I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee and present my testimony in favor of adding more park rangers um, or more permanent positions for the Boston Park Rangers Mounted Unit. As a past volunteer, I've had the opportunity to get to know some of the rangers and the horses. In the spring of 2012, I volunteered for the Mounted Unit as my high school senior project by helping care for the horses. Uh, I enjoyed working with the horses and spending time with the rangers. <clears throat> During my internship, I continued to volunteer for the mounted unit over the summer. During my time volunteering, <clears throat> the permanent staff were constantly training part-time employees, teaching them how to care for the horses and work, care for and work with the horses. When I visited the mounted unit during my winter break, I was introduced to the new part-time employees yet again. Every time I go back to visit the mounted unit, there is always a new part-time employee being trained. The benefit of full-time staff cannot be overstated, both in terms of efficiency of training and having consistency to those caring for the horses and going out on patrol. The park rangers mounted unit is an important component of the public safety, patrolling the parks and, comp and that comprise the emerald necklace. They play an even more important role as a public relations ambassadors for, for uh, law enforcement in the city of Boston. I've seen firsthand children and adults be drawn to the horses and engaged in conversation with the rangers, creating goodwill and a sense of calm and security. Um, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to offer my testimony um, for, for the additional uh, permanent positions of the Boston Rangers Mounted Unit. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. There was uh, after J is Jan here? If Jan, okay, thank you. So um, Pat, yeah. Hi, um, I'm here actually with two other people. We're all talking about the same thing. So could the three of us stand Great. here together? Thank you, Whitney and Magda. So first, I want to thank the Parks Department. You're so amazingly awesome, and we appreciate everything you do, from helping us with our goats a couple of years ago to <laughs> to um, just keeping our our parks and our playgrounds and our ball fields and our urban wilds as clean and beautiful as you can. But we're here today specifically to talk about the urban wilds. They're different from parks, they're different from ball fields, they're different from playgrounds. And my understanding is there's no line item in the budget to maintain the urban wilds. The urban wilds are critical because they're conservation land, they're woodland, and they are in this time of rapid development in the city, um, and always, they're critical to helping us mitigate the effects of climate change in Boston. They, the tree canopy cleans and cools the air. Um, they, the tree roots help absorb the water, keep it clean and, and uh, healthy. And um, in addition to all that, it provides a different kind of experience for residents. There's a lot of research that's been done now to show that people who spend time in the woods as opposed to playgrounds and parks um, have lower blood pressure, lower incidence of depression. They, it's even being used to treat ADHD in children. So um, the urban wilds are critical. 
Now we have in Hyde Park, there are 30 urban wilds around the city. We have eight in Hyde Park. I personally work at, as the assistant director of the Southwest Boston CDC and someone who manages our youth jobs program that does urban wild restoration. We work um, with five friends groups. We try our best in the spring to clean, do cleanups, trash pickup, mowing. The youth try their best to do um, trail rebuilding and pruning, but it's overwhelming. The amount of work this winter, we had so many down trees across the road, bro trees broken in half, um, the invasive plants, buckthorn, multiflora rose, poison ivy, Japanese knotweed, wind their way up healthy trees, native trees, and squeeze them to death and kill them. The soil gets degraded, construction companies dump in the urban wilds, landscapers dump, all of that promotes invasive growth. So there's a critical need for friends, uh, for an annual maintenance budget for urban wilds, because as friends groups and youth groups, we cannot possibly um, do justice to the urban wilds. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Whitney Lagondi um, and whoever lives at 200 Clarendon Street, Sarah Freeman. Uh, we're part of the same group, if you wouldn't mind. I apologize that I had signed the wrong sheet, I think, so I apologize. But uh, my name is Magdalena Ayed. I'm with um, Pat um, and her as well to advocate for the urban wilds. Uh, Pat said a very succinct, six, succinctly, um, we have an issue with the urban wilds in East Boston as well. The only difference is we do not have a lot of acreage, and we have really only three. Uh, one of them is the Condor Street Overlook, which you'd be surprised that absolutely nobody, even including public works people, have no idea that that is an urban wild. That's an issue. We clean it up, friends of the Boston Harbor Walk, climb over that fence, sorry, maybe I'm not supposed to do that, but I climb, we climb over that fence, and really we are, are capturing a lot of debris and we're also fostering a lot of ocean stewardship. Um, it's critical for climate resiliency. There's a buckling seawall. I mean, we have invasive species. Um, this particular park doesn't have a lot of upland, but it is in a very critical area of wetlands. So if we talk about climate, if we talk about conservation, um, as Pat said, we really need to increase uh, the, the amount of, you know, in the budget to maintain, because it's overwhelming for us as volunteer groups. Um, and it's also critical areas for improving climate resiliency and frankly for education, marine and environmental education in communities like East Boston um, is really critical. So we are here to advocate for more of a budget for maintenance of the urban wilds. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, good afternoon. My name is Whitney Lagonde. In the summer, I coordinate the Southwest Boston CDC's Green Team Program, which hires Boston youth to prepare walking trails, remove invasive species, and educate the community about the proper use of the woods. But despite our best efforts, we cannot possibly keep up the amount of maintenance that is required. Ongoing maintenance challenges include hazardous tree pruning along roadways, sidewalks, and trails, invasive plant management, erosion control, signage repair and replacement, fencing repair and replacement, wall repair, carpentry, collection of disposal of bulky waste. This routine site maintenance is not only essential to keeping the urban wilds ecologically healthy, but is necessary to keep the woods safe for the residents to enjoy. Therefore, we urge you to add a line item for the urban wild maintenance to the city's annual budget. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sarah Freeman, I think I, oh. Frederica Veekley, Jane Akaba, and Liz Visa. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Freeman uh, from Jamaica Plain. I'm here on behalf of the Arbor Way Coalition, which is a Park Friends group for the Arbor Way section of the Emerald Necklace and many related environmental issues. Uh, the Arbor Way is a DCR Parkway, so we don't have any direct requests for the Arbor Way, but being within the city of Boston, we care deeply about Boston's parks and wish them to be the best that they can be. So in that spirit, we do appreciate that Boston has been very generous to the parks recently, um, but there's still so much room for improvement and so please don't take the comments as criticism, but rather raising the bar, right? Um, so 
without being too repetitious, the Park Rangers Mounted Unit, uh, gratifying to hear that the recognition that the uh, seasonal employees are not a good long-term plan and that a lot of effort in the training uh, for very short return. So um, anything you can do. They did lose six positions 10 years ago and rebuilding uh, the best you can do, we would support. Um, the Muddy River Restoration Project, I'm sorry to say I couldn't understand how it's described in the budget. Was happy to see there is some money, not sure what it's for, but um, in the conversations I've been in, there's a lot of concern that phase one that had a, a ribbon cutting with much fanfare a year ago, um, and is named after former Park Commissioner Justine Meliff. Um, what is the status there? Who's taking care of it? I don't know if this is the hearing for maintenance, but a question that is on many minds. Um, I sent an email to our, the Arbor Way Coalition yesterday uh, asking for people's comments, or a week ago, and then again yesterday. And here are some of the comments that came from the group. Um, one from, there's a lot of, and this applies throughout the city, there are a lot of historic stone walls that are fabulous. They add to Boston's character, but they do require some care. And someone who lives on Prince Street, um, parallel to Parkman Drive, right next to the pond, says it's really hard watching this wall deteriorate. Any funding request for the historic wall would be great, even if it's for initial maintenance to remove the strangling vines that dig into the stone. Um, so just a plea in general for Boston to be sensitive about stone wall ongoing maintenance. Uh, water fountains at Arnold Arboretum range in various states of repair from working to having been not working for multiple years. Um, might be a larger problem than the fountain itself because apparently there have been efforts to fix it, but um, the summer's coming, climate change, it's hot out there, and we want people to be able to fill their refillable bottles instead of bringing plastic into the parks. Two more quick items. One uh, from a resident who has spent considerable time knocking on people's doors, encouraging them to plant or care for newly planted trees, says caring for and replacing dead street trees and helping homeowners get a front yard tree will do a lot to improve our local air quality and slow down traffic. Um, and last but not least from me, um, I think I've said this a number of years and I don't know what the answer is, but I would love to see more recycling in our parks so that when people do bring a plastic bottle, it doesn't end up in the pond or on a path or something and have to pay an employee to come pick it up or wait for a volunteer. So I know they do exist in some places, like the Arboretum has them, and I think Brookline just put a bunch out. So I encourage you to think about that. Thank you for the opportunity Thank to you, comment. Sarah. Hi, my name is Frederica Vikley. I'm a longtime Fenway resident and um, a longtime park participant. And I will say this is, this is really something everyone should come to a hearing for the Parks Department and listen to everyone speak, the counselors um, and the residents. It's, it's so educational and uh, one gets a, a true appreciation for the magnitude of our resources and our assets and also the accompanying problems that go with those. Um, you, you, you've seen me before talking on behalf of the, of the Boston Mounted Park Rangers. Well, it's deja vu, I'm back, <clears throat> and I'm asking for your increased support for the, the Boston Park Rangers Mounted Unit. They're a vital and effective security presence, not only in the Back Bay Fens, which is where I spend most of my time, including in the Victory Garden area, um, but throughout the Emerald Necklace Park system, they are vital security as well as ambassadors. Um, I was really happy to hear uh, Chris Cook say 
um, that we are greatly relieved and, and we thank you and, and the city council um, and the mayor over the, the years that have increased um, the budget for the, the Boston Park, Mar Park Rangers Mounted Unit um, to get away from um, such a great fundraising effort on behalf of the nonprofit group that makes everyone sleep better at night. But we never sleep well enough. Um, so I, I'm disappointed that the budget calls for only one new position, permanent position. At this rate, it will take years to reconstitute the unit to the pre-downturn um, levels. Meanwhile, the need for security in our parks continues to grow with more activities taking place in our parks, some of it increasingly problematic. The mounted unit is a, value comp a valuable component of a greater effort that um, is needed to keep these problems and the, the kinds of problems that we're experiencing in, in, in my neighborhood parks, uh, to keep them from spiraling out of control. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's more that the value um, of, of the ranges for their security is to prevent the problems that get really, frankly, almost unmanageable. Um, so with, with the vetting of personnel and training taking a, a, a lot of time to get the actual rangers out into the field, we really need upfront funding. So I'm requesting that the equivalent, in whatever form this takes, of three new positions be enabled by uh, the council. Um, and please, please support, see, please support the efforts uh, of of Chris and and uh, the chief Gene to to get this program strengthened. We need it in our neighborhood. We need it throughout the Emerald Necklace Parks. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the parks in the city and in our downtown. It's wonderful that I, I agree with Freddie. I think everyone should come and hear these hearings and hear about the hard work that's being done by this incredible department and the, and the granular work that needs to be thought about in order to make our parks strong. Um, my name is Liz Visa, Executive Director of the Friends of the Public Garden, and we are in our 48th year partnership with the city to care for the uh, public garden, the Boston Common and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. These are neighborhood parks for over 35,000 people in five neighborhoods, but they're much more than neighborhood parks. They are green spaces that are used intensively by the entire city and beyond. We have been seeing record crowds coming in. Just as soon as this, the warm weather hits, you can't even get through the mid-block crossing from the common into the, into the garden because there are so many people using these amazing parks. Um, the Friends invest over a million dollars uh, directly into the parks, but it's critical that private support not be seen as a rationale for not continuing to support the Parks Department and raising the budget year after year. We like to see this go up. We're happy to say that it's going up and it's great, but we can't feel too comfortable about that, particularly as we've gotten CPA funding. Those of us who worked hard to pass that were very excited, but we also want to see a baseline budget for the Parks Department not, not start to, to slump because of getting money from CPA. It's just a measure of how much money the parks really do need to be the best in the nation, which is what the mayor wants them to be, and we fully support his vision, and to get there, it takes resources. Um, as you know, and we've heard that money coming in from the Winthrop Square uh, agreements has been wonderful to support master planning in both the um, Boston Common and Franklin Park and a completion of the Emerald Necklace. We're very excited to be able to work with the Parks Department on that master plan for the Boston Common um, and uh, listen to the community about what their vision is for our most intensively used in Central Park. But a lot of the budget money is capital, and we still need, you've heard from us year after year, we're getting more maintenance money, but we do need continuing improvements in the maintenance um, realm, significantly more to keep up with the level of maintenance necessary for all of our green spaces in Boston. Two years ago, the mayor's budget added a second maintenance shift to the common, and that was a wonderful thing and very helpful. However, if there is an, an emergency need in another part, that just have to, has to be pulled off to deal with that need. So we need to be able to serve the commons needs and every neighborhood's needs. 
In the capital realm, I'd like to point out one pressing need in uh, our downtown parks, and it's a historic building in the public garden that serves an important function for the garden's maintenance crew as well as storage for the swan boats. It's way overdue, past overdue, for renovations, and there was a study that was done a couple of years ago about that, but as you heard from the commissioner, you know, when, when uh, development is, is, is very high and, and popular in the city, the uh, bids come in high, this bid came in high, but then the Parks Department rethought about that, the scope that they have for that um, building and thought maybe we should be improving and expanding that scope. We're fully supportive of that. We know it's a public facilities um, task and not primarily the Parks Department's task when we're dealing with buildings, and we know that a little building in the park is not gonna compete successfully and happily against police and, and fire stations, but this is an important building serving the, the maintenance crew and the swan boats in, in an important green space, and we need to get that back on the, the docket for, for support and, and uh, renovation before it deteriorates further. On the citywide level, there's a need for more tree cover, including ongoing care for them on the streets as well as in the parks. Trees manage stormwater runoff, cool the earth, and store carbon. There are single best mitigators of climate change. This year's Parks Department budget for the first time has $100,000 for maintenance of the parks trees, which is really wonderful to see. But I'm gonna guess that the ask was many times that much because it, the need in, throughout our parks is a lot more than $100,000. So let's keep this trend going and improve maintenance of our parks trees and our city's trees. And I know you're gonna be having a, a Parkman um, fund budget, uh, hearing at one o'clock, but now it's gonna be later, but I'm gonna make a, a note about the Parkman fund appropriation. It's worth noting that this year, $1.2 million appropriation is used primarily for parks maintenance staff. This was a practice begun in crisis in the 1980s during Proposition Two and a Half. It has since become routine. The city should be funding this staffing need from the budget and using the fund's resources for parks care and improvements according to the fund's purpose. And lastly, we do applaud the addition of a permanent park ranger. You're hearing that from a lot of people, but um, the force is half the size it was 10 years ago. And as I said, I, I, record numbers of people are pouring into our downtown parks. Uh, many of a, a summer Sunday, or a, a spring Sunday, you'll see kids climbing the trees in the garden, bicycles happily riding through, dogs off a leash, and not a, a ranger in sight. So they're a security force, they're an ambassadorial force. They are, the most important thing that they do is enforce park regulations, and we are in desperate need for those regulations to be enforced. So we uh, add our voices to those of others. Thank you so much. Thank you. Karen Borg, Broder. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Julia Donahue, and I'm the president of the Friends Group for the Park Ranger Mounted Unit. I will only take a few minutes because I'm sure everybody is starving. <laughs> um, I think you have my letter, at least I hope you have my letter electronically, so I'll be very efficient here, I hope. First of all, I want to thank the mayor and the commissioner for their support of the park rangers. Um, without them, I'm not sure what would be happening today, but we thank them deeply. Secondly, I am definitely in favor of prudent use of funds. It's essential. However, not at the cost of the security of the parks. It's been 10 years, ladies and gentlemen, and Jean is down six positions. We can't go another three years without getting him fully fended. So I appreciate the fact that the mayor put one position in, and I'm sure that will help with deployment. That's a great idea. And I applaud the counselors that will support one more position. I am here to implore you to think of adding two more positions. That way, if we do this next year, then the Ranger unit will be effective. And 1,200 acres is an awful lot of property to limp along in. So I am begging you, please consider that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen, I'm Karen Monty Brodeck. I think that I was the name you were 
Dr. Nicole, sorry. Um, my parents gave me that name and now I have to live with it. Uh, my name is Karen Monty Brodick. I'm the president of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy. Um, I really do appreciate all the support that the mayor and the council has given uh, this department. Uh, I've worked at two other city parks departments, New York and San Francisco, and people don't work for parks um, unless they really want to. It's actually, it's a really hard job. These guys' phones ring all the time, I'm sure, as yours do, and um, I can tell that they actually, they really, really care about the parks that they're here to support. Um, I want to mention uh, that two things primarily. Number one, uh, also continuing the, the chorus of voices that you've been hearing here today to add to the park ranger's budget, um, to provide for uh, full-time employees. The, um, it, you know, it is really, really hard to work with the seasonal staff. So if um, there could be an increase, it sounds like uh, we're talking about two or three new people, that would be fantastic. Um, the emerald necklace, as actually many, many people have said today, uh, particularly areas uh, around the Fenway are particularly suffering from some very complicated, um, very complicated public safety issues right now. And I think the horses might be needed in a different way now more than ever um, in a way that we hadn't appreciated in the past. So I'm very um, interested to see if that can be supported by this council uh, and the, the mayor's budget. Um, I real, I'm very encouraged by the level of capital investment that you've uh, been providing uh, and the mayor's budget provides for, uh, for the parks department. Um, however, there's still just so much more to do. Um, our city parks are the places where the public really comes together. Um, it's really the space that can provide a platform for our young people, um, people of all different means to, to connect and move to a next, the next place in terms of connecting with their neighborhoods and the communities. Um, and so the parks are really the place we need to put money. I know a lot of times uh, we think about the ways that other uh, different agencies and departments um, can support our communities and our families. And I think those are essential as well. Um, but a lot of times we don't realize the value of parks because it doesn't come, you know, we don't have tests, we don't have students take tests in parks or those kind of other measures. So it's, um, it's something that I think uh, we, we understand more and more as more and more data comes out that the quality of our public space um, has uh, better impacts in public health in other ways than we had realized in the past. The last thing I wanted to mention um, is around the Muddy River. Um, over the next couple of years, you're going to start to see more and more of me and other advocates as the Muddy River restoration completes uh, its first phase, as that piece of the project um, becomes uh, the responsibility of this department and DCR and other agencies to maintain. Uh, it's an important area where we have now daylighted a section of the river. Um, that is the section in front of the Landmark Center. It's going to be very, very important to maintain it, and it's going to—it's a new uh, project for us. Um, it's a—it's a new uh, landscape planted with new native plants, and I think that's going to be something we're going to start to do up and down the necklace as the phase two of the Army Corps project moves forward. And uh, I think we're going to have to get creative about how we do that. And I'm really excited to work with everyone here to do that. Uh, maybe there's some some lessons we can learn from the Urban Wilds program, which also um, probably deals with some of the same landscapes. Um, I think more and more as we look into the future, the lessons from the design that Frederick Law Olmsted blessed Boston with of the Emerald Necklace is going to give us a path forward on how we actually manage all the lands in the, uh, in the Boston area. And I really hope we can uh, learn some invaluable lessons and perhaps get some ideas as we move forward um, to protect the entire city from uh, what is a changing world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is anybody else uh, wishing to testify? Seeing and hearing none, I'm going to return to our questions. Um, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, um, I wanted to also recognize uh, the good work of Tom Sullivan. I have an, uh, I think just want the Market Street burial ground that is maintained by Parks as well as the Evergreen Cemetery. Evergreen is not considered historical, am I right? Or is that? Oh, I don't, I don't think it's big I, H historical as far as right, landmarks, but it's right. certainly, we treat it as yeah, a historical yeah, property. I, obviously, and I yeah. appreciate the investment last year in the pathways and working with Tom on restoring some of those antique signs. And, uh, you know, we had discussions about, um, you know, pro possibly tapping CPA funds in the coming year. And I've had meetings with Christine. I think to make them all uniform would be 
a significant improvement. And I, I'm, I'm committing to working with the folks from CPA and trying to find someone to kind of sponsor that. But Tom uh, could actually help maybe because he had that contact with Absolutely. the sign restoration company, and that would I think would complete. Um, you know, the the additional improvements over the years, and I want to thank you for your commitment to that. Um, I, I wanted to get a better sense, too, as someone who voted for Winthrop Square to go forward. I think it was a, a good vote. Um, and we had the BPDA down here uh, just the other day mm -hmm. talking about the first installment, I mm -hmm. think, is coming 102, 102 million. Uh, and I forget the breakdown. Do you know the breakdown? There's BHA, money going to Old Colony. There's money going to the Common, Franklin Park. Sure, yeah. So the breakdown for as far as the open space is mm -hmm. that there's $28 million designated for Franklin Park. There's $28 million designated for Boston Common. And there's $11 million dedicated to Columbia Road. Columbia Road, the only thing I would asterisk there is that there's an enormous amount of transportation work that would need to be uh, completed there in order mm -hmm. to think about that as a park or civic or a green space or, mm -hmm. you know, has ecological value as well as the ability to get people to and from Boston Harbor from those that critical link that's missing from the Olmstead plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're also looking to operationalize some of those funds. So mm -hmm. in partnership with the Friends of the Public Garden, we're developing a trust where five million of the 28 million will be put in trust and that would give us not only a fund that we could reinvest in as future development happens in the city, um, but what we would do is we would use the interest to augment uh, maintenance activities on Boston Common. Uh, what's very important is like CPA, the approach is to augment, not supplant. Right. Um, and we're developing the same um, sort of trust with the Franklin Park Coalition as well. Um, yeah, and I, so I wanted a little more clarity because, you know, uh, tw 28 million for those parks, I support. That was one of the reasons why I voted for it. Um, but I, are we thinking in terms of capital improvements mm -hmm. and if, the, if it's capital improvements, is this money going to go to pay the debt service for capital, or how's that going to work? It's an interesting question. We haven't really thought that far about is okay. whether or not you would actually bond specifically on that, and that's not something, you know, maybe that would be more at the chief level, whether or not. We, we, you know, I don't think I have that authority to decide whether or not we're right. going to bond. What I would say, though, is that we should look at it in those terms. $23 million, surprisingly enough, actually wouldn't go that far on Boston right. Common. Mm -hmm. Boston Common is an extraordinarily expensive property to build on. So is Franklin Park. I mean, mm -hmm. there's there's probably two or three million dollars worth of deferred tree work that mm -hmm. could happen in mm -hmm. Franklin Park. The opportunity we really have with the funds is to take individual projects and, part and partner with like-minded philanthropic and corporate giving as well as other friends groups to make sure that we extend those investments. So when you look at a property like the Frog Pond, maybe we use uh, these funds to help with the redesign of the Frog Pond, but then we look to other external partners along with our partners in the Friends of the Public Garden to see how we can fund that. So the idea is to really use these use this as catalyst capital investments, mm -hmm. and that's how we'll actually get through to a complete Franklin Park master plan or a complete right. Boston Common master plan. I think it would be a mistake to use this once in a generational opportunity to just do one signature project. Right. Uh, I agree. I just w I, I want to get more clarity sure. on how those funds will be expended, either through capital or, or making them operational or paying down bonds or whatever, because there's going to be another 60 some odd million following that in coming years when the condos are sold. So, and I'd like to get some money for that for my neighborhood for those projects, since I voted for it and some others didn't. Um, I would also um, like to commend um, Liza again. Um, Cassidy's coming online. Can you give me a little um, more on the time? I know we talked a couple of months ago, and things are, are things more firm at this point, I guess. They are more firm. We're going to go out to bid this summer and hopefully be in construction this fall. Oh, great. Yeah. And, and, and that's with the field house and, and the, the park. Yes. We're going to be bidding. Well, 
PFD will bid the field house, mm -hmm. um, but we're writing into the specs of those contracts that the contractors will have to coordinate with each other so that we can have right. those projects happening simultaneously. Right. And that was a very impactful project that it is actually, I think they have, they've just had the ribbon cutting. Um, you know, you did some great work on how uh, it was gonna impact the park, but how it could also benefit the park. And I think we struck a great balance there and uh, you know, it's open and it's developed and it's no longer the vacant cinema site that everybody hated looking at. So thank you. I'm gonna uh, now recognize Councilor Frank Baker. Good afternoon, Chris, Chief, and, and your team. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, thanks for what you're doing in the parks. So most of my parks look great. Um, Chris, can you talk a little bit about um, the Lyman Fountain, Coppering Square? Sure. Um, you know, we've been working together on that, that and I'm, I'm trying to figure a way where there's a, an active friends group there. It's a yep. historical fountain. It's in an area that it, it's the front door of Bowdoin Street basically and I think if we did that over it would it would go a long way but we're not in we're not in capital is there a way yep. that we can kind of move this along a little a little um, faster than, than the regular capital route where we already have a design and sure so uh, we have a very very strong conceptual design at, at this at this yep. point um, as far as the Parks Department's position on the project, it's an extraordinary opportunity. It's almost as if, if you had to draw up exactly what Community Preservation Act was intended to do, it would be this. I mean, not only is it, you could argue that it's a new green space because it's such a, it's in such poor condition, it's a highly underutilized green space at the time. Um, it's certainly in a neighborhood that we want to make strategic investments in, we want to beautify, and then the fact that it actually is a historical preservation uh, project at the same time. So we strongly support uh, Community Preservation Act funding for it. I would say that the conceptual design uh, still has, um, we have to run it through um, our ability to maintain it at mm -hmm. this point, if that's it. But, but I think we're on the, if, if this was broken up into fifths, I'd say we'd be at the last fifth of that design review. Is that fair to say, Liza? Yeah, I think it's just about materials, that sort of thing. Yeah, point. so we're making material choices as far as whether or not what maintenance things. So that being said, we would strongly support not only CPA funds, but we would also support any Brown Fund applications that they want to make. And then I think what we'd have to look at, Councillor, to, to your point about how do we look at this in the capital cycle? Um, if it is that ready to go and it would be that impactful and there were external funds as far as Brown or CPA, mm -hmm. I think we'd have to be looking at FY20. Is, is there a way that we could augment it? Maybe not specifically with a capital line item, but because it is an existing space that we own, could we look at it through general park improvements? Um, so is there a bite of the apple that the parks department could participate in, whether you look at strategic tree plantings that the landscape architect might decide on or some of the pathway work or some of the bench work. So that's a long way of saying so, so we'd be excited about the opportunity. To yeah, so also if there, there's infrastructure work there with the, uh, with the water, would that, would that fall on parks or would that, because you're out in the street now, is that public works? Do we have to involve public works in this or would it be funding through the park department? Oh, I, I, I'd, be in, I, I'd be embarrassed to give you the wrong answer, so I'm, I'm happy to, to <laughs> yeah. follow up with you. I, I think there's multiple agencies involved. It's, so it's yeah. not only Public Works because of the external sidewalk, but it's yeah. also obviously Water Sewer Commission. Water and Sewer Commission uh, highly regulates any new ornamental <laughs> fountains that would be coming into their system, right? Because yeah. that, that causes potential problems for them, so potential so maintenance so problems with them. And then, of course, at the end of the day, it's usually the underlying property owner that may have to fund some of those issues. So in that way, it would fall to the Parks Department. Liza, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. Well, I think that's right. I mean, the approvals would be required from both of those other agencies, but usually the cost of the work is, is borne by our project budget. Okay. So they would put the plan together, but, but you guys have to pay for it. We would typically put the plan together, but they would review it and approve it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, because that's something I think that, that, that is important. Chris, and CPA is looking for shovel ready, so I'm trying to get a a larger commitment from the city to, to say to CPA, we'll be shovel ready 
whenever that date is. Yeah, and I, I, I listen, I certainly would never presume to speak for the CPA committee, but what I would say is that they were definitely looking for shovel ready in this first round of projects. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll be the same um, protocol moving forward. Okay, so it could be not necessarily shovel ready, but it could be year out shovel ready and get commitments. And even, and honestly, even if it's not, the they are truly in the last leg of that conceptual design yeah. review. I mean, when you start talking about what materials the Parks Department can remove snow off of, yeah. you're, you're pretty close to the finish line design. Okay, good. So we'll just have the group just keep doing what they're doing and... Yeah, I just want to make it very clear that Ed Cook is no relation to me, so he's the chair of the Friends group <laughs> right there, so I yeah. want to make sure that no one thinks that I'm supporting Ed <laughs> just because of his last name. <laughs> well, I'm supporting Ed. That's right. Okay. Um, can, you talk, can you talk a little bit, um, just District 3, three here, um, Downer, Downer Ave, can you update on that? Garvey Park, update on that. And Absolutely. So I'll talk a little bit about Garvey. Um, we're at a wonderful point now where the community has basically agreed on a final conceptual design. There's a few tweaks that we have to make um, over the next couple lights, of weeks. Lights, lights there or no lights? As, as far as lights and the design, I, yeah. I can get back to you with the final okay, decision yeah. on that. But we did decide on turf, artificial turf, which uh, what I would just throw my two cents in as far as whether or not we can afford it with the cost estimates. If you have artificial turf there and you have the ability to play, whether or not the lights go to 10 o'clock at night, that's an entirely different conversation. Mm -hmm. But to not have the investment of lights so that you could actually benefit from off-season activation of the space, even if the lights go off early and mm -hmm. you know, so people don't want it shining in there, I think that it would be a lost opportunity to not explore lights at a turf facility. Yeah, I agree. Um, and as far as uh, getting it out to bid, uh, we, we had a really productive conversation um, uh, with uh, Representative Hunt talking about the possibilities about using some of the DCR space for an off-leash dog park. We'll continue those conversations, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to delay getting to work. So we're looking at a fall bid um, and maybe getting some site work done before winter, although it's more likely that it's spring construction. Next year. That's right, sir. Okay, good. And down around? As far as down around, I, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Liza. We're, we're finally through the last stages of the design process. That's right, so we have 60% construction documents um, that we're reviewing right now, and that will go out to bid this summer, hopefully for fall construction start also. Start in this, this That's fall. That's the hope, yep. Excellent, and, and um, th those stairs there, Chris, do we have a, I know it's public It's public nope. works, but that, that whole area, were we ever able to do anything with public works on that slope in the, in the stairs? So uh, it would be a lost opportunity when we're not in yeah. construction to talk about how we can augment those stairs with our existing lighting structure. So we're yeah. going to be helping them out a little bit, uh, for lack of a better term, up at the top, right? So yeah. we're going to be pruning back. Uh, we're going to be lighting up the stairs as far as we can go. Um, as far as the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance of it, I got to say that um, I was just so impressed with Mike Roll and obviously Commissioner Osgood and Chief Osgood's team, um, but especially uh, Mike, Roll, Mike Roll really made it a focus this last winter. More often than not, those steps were actually clear. Um, it, is a, it is a massive maintenance undertaking. I yeah. think Public Works did a, a really good job this year. Um, but there's some design changes that would need to be made along those stairs in order to make it easier for Public Works to take care of them. Um, I think that's still an ongoing conversation. I will say that we are going to try to do as much tree work as we can. In the back there on the, the slope? In the, in the back on the slope. Um, it's, it is a tight budget. Unfortunately, all of our uh, Natasha White, who is amazing, and she's our budget analyst here. She knows all of our, all, all of our bids are coming in high these days, so that, you know, so it, our budgets are getting tighter. Um, but again, it would be a lost opportunity to not clear out some of those dead trees there because the view from that park is spectacular yeah. and people would feel safer. Yeah. Um, Cliff, thank you, Chris. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about Clifford Park? Sure. Uh, what, 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 what are you seeing down there for um, needle activity? What, what does it look like in behind the stands? Is it sure. as bad as it was when we, when we went over there a little while ago and, and did the major cleanup? Uh, so it is, Councillor. So, um, so the needles are a chronic, everyday problem at Clifford Park. I don't want to speak for the Public Health Commission because yeah. they would actually have the data to support, but I would say that it's, uh, it's, if it's not number one, it's the number two park where we find the most needles. Mm -hmm. um, our maintenance crew uh, cleans up 
Neil's there every day, as does the Public Health Commission Sharps team, as does Boston EMS, as does youth athletic coaches and, you know, Parks Department, other yeah. Parks Department staff. Uh, that being said, uh, we, have a, we have a really great opportunity um, because of um, uh, leadership at the city council level and the advocacy um, at BPDA from the community. Uh, there is a developer that's going to remove those those old traditional WPA s style stands mm -hmm. that actually create two very negative spaces in the park um, where there's there's lots See of. See me getting the hook there, that's Chris. A new that's, send, that's a new he's got to at least finish his statement. I, I speak in paragraphs, <laughs> not sentences. I, I know. So, uh, so the, the the long answer is that the stands are coming down. Yeah. which should get more eyes into the park and uh, and allow our security lighting to do a better job. Okay. So I had a really good meeting on Clifford Park with, with someone that's that's coming there and wants to be part of Clifford Park, and we should look at camera plans there also if you're open to it. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I believe they may be leaving, so before uh, I start, I want to thank, of course, Sarah Freeman, from, who we heard from, and Celeste Walker, uh, two great park advocates, Jamaica Plain neighbors. The three of us, along with Commissioner Cook and my wife, spent Monday night at the Arnold Arboretum for a wonderful um, uh, really do screening of a documentary uh, that shows sort of the relationship from Chinese chi from China and Chinese park system in the, in the United States and it was really really a moving thing so thank you both um, want to dive right into some of those questions starting with something Sarah brought up uh, recycling in our parks what do we need to do to make it happen yeah so um I'm going to have Dennis answer most of this question, but what I would say is that it's it's no longer an option for us to choose whether or not we offer recycling, right? So for the past uh, three or four years uh, that I've been lucky enough to have this position, uh, we've uh, picked up recycling bins where it's sort of uh, easy for us to do it, right? So mm -hmm. Christopher Columbus Park, we have a partnership with the Public Works Department because we actually have curbside uh, trash pickup from Public Works there. So it was very easy for us to put recycling out there. Uh, Millennium Park, same thing. There's a Public, wo public Works um, uh, uh, district yard, yard yeah. there. So we're very easy to, to drop off recycling there. Um, what we've started is the sometimes painful process of implementing recycling in some of those parks that don't benefit from Public Works Yard, and it's frankly really, really hard work. Um, we have a, a fleet of seven packers, I think, Dennis, and uh, in packers, you know, uh, they break a lot because of everything, all the moving parts yeah. on them. And what happens is that the recycling can't be co-mingled with the packers. And so uh, what we've done this year is we've started adding the clear, the clear uh, plastic bags and we're trying to implement recycling bins into the parks that don't have those district yards next to them. What I'll say the difficulty is, is that our maintenance crews who also um, have a lot of new hires and they also have seasonal workers associated with them, we don't always consistently receive the same amount of training as opposed to what's sure. recycling, what's trash. And so what we wanna make sure is that we're creating the best opportunity for success without commingling. So some of the places that we've introduced recycling where we don't have that clear delineation of public works, not, pardon the pun, have had has had mixed results. But uh, Chief, Blackman has made it an absolute priority uh, in his cabinet that he expects it and he expects us to implement it. As far as the specifics of what we're doing is for the strategic investment, I'll turn it over to Dennis Roach. Yeah, Thank so, you. Um, you know, Chris, Chris touched on many of these points, but we did pilot the program in many of those parks that it was easy, easy sure. for us to implement it. Um, looking at across strategically, is we are in a, in, a, in a process right now where we need to upgrade our packers to have dual stream packers. And many of our seven packers now are over 15 years of age. So over the course of the next year, our plan is to look at these packers, work with the budget office, look at ways to buy new packers. We actually have one on order from last year's strategic, I mean, from our lease purchase program. What's a, what's a packer cost? They're about, park? They're about $200,000 and $230,000 wow. if we're talking dual stream. Okay. So we have one that's ready to go, and, and, and you know they take about a year to build. And how many and do we that. need for a full fleet? It's set. We have seven. It's seven in <coughs> a full fleet. Okay. Okay. So, so that that's the investment that you're looking on those lines. Um, 
The other thing, the other thing we're doing um, within the, and this is our, our new maintenance director, Greg Mossman, is we're looking strategically about how we place barrels and where we place recycling barrels. Yeah. Like, do we need 80 barrels in a particular park, or is it 40 barrels and 40 barrels recycling? And is that encouraging more recycling and things? So those are the things strategically we were looking at now to kind of shift focus about how people think to, to throw things away and change the way they, that they yeah. use a park and things like that. So we're, we're starting to do that in smaller little pocket parks. Um, we've, we've been, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but mm -hmm. we've been um, working, and Commissioner, you've come to a couple of our Clean Boston uh, meetings where we're trying to get folks, particularly from the Main Streets districts as it relates to trash and litter on Main Streets, but I think parks could be a good added conversation. Very briefly, and I think the answer may be no, but let's think, think this through. Would, would the restrictions on advertisements and parks prohibit, say, us renting out ad space on a, on a, a, tra on a recycle bin so, to help defer the cost? So currently they would, um, but we have a broad interpretation to yeah. allow pilots. I think that's something we should, we so. should seriously consider to help pay for it and, and you know, we could control what, what type of advertising would go on it. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, um, phenomenal job doing the cleanup after the three nor'easters we had this year. The, the first week of March, I, I, I typically do snow walks around my district after a big snowstorm. I did a, a 14 and a half mile walk the Sunday after that Friday nor'easter, um, responding to either social media hits or texts or things that I had heard about. Um, how much did we, do you have the figures on what we've spent on just storm cleanup? Yeah, well the, so it's diff it's difficult to tease out um, all the overtime yeah. that goes into it. Although we do code it as snow, so we'd be happy to provide that. Nicole, I don't know if you had a ballpark on the actual snow operations from the storms. Uh, I believe the contracting was in at about eighty thousand. That, that, that's for contracted services. Yeah, so, I don't have the overtime, but I can get that. So I thought 80, it would have been more than that. That's a well, price. So eighty thousand um, dollars took care of three locations. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that was that the put that in perspective. So that was the contracted services. Then on top of you, ha you have that in the over overtime. What was really dramatic was the the overall tree con tree costs. And so when you look at the fact that hundreds of thousands of dollars of our you know our tree, millions yeah you know tree tree budget can be spent, and it really just uh, lends itself to the the work that Ch Chief's doing on the fact that maintenance operations are being affected by climate change. Yeah, and to that end, how um, it's a lengthy process. If, if someone if someone reports to us or to you or to three one one that there is a dying tree on their curb, sure. How long is it going to? It's, it's going to be more than a year. Yeah, well, it, so it, it takes more than a year to remove it. Yeah, and so the process that goes into that is that it's actually inspected uh, fairly soon. What's okay. important is for the constituent to not get, the most frustrating thing that can happen to any constituent on 311 is when it says case closed and yeah. they're still looking at their dying yeah. tree, right? Like that's the worst thing that can happen. We, we need, that's not you guys, but we need to come up with better messaging because that's. Well, it's, it's it, 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 and when it's, when it's parks cues, it, it's us and we're, and we're getting a little bit better every day. We also have the uh, frustrating capacity to close cases when we reallocate them to long-term capital. So that's something that we parks needs to work on the the folks that do it are, are are fantastic and they're only as good as the you know it's just like yeah. a computer they're only as good as the input we give them um, but as far as the trees the trees actually get inspected in a in a much faster way what happens is whether or not the tree is an immediate hazard or not and that that's what gets determined so a, a tree could be dying but a dead tree can stand on a road sure. for, for three or four years. We would never allow that. Yeah. We would remove it in our in our SLA that we have associated with it. If it's deemed a hazard, it, it comes down immediately, it, almost immediately. Yeah. And in fact, in the middle of the night when we have hazard trees hanging on wires, we'll work with Eversource to remove those trees. Um, I think what happens is the frustrating component becomes that most people also want a tree replanted. Yeah. Um, and so when you start looking at, okay, well maybe it's um, six months uh, before a tree gets removed, and then you can only plant the tree two times out of the year because trees can only be planted in either spring yeah, or in yeah. fall. Um, that's when it can come, it becomes frustrating to the constituent. It could, it's, in most cases, it's a year and a half, two year process. Yeah. Can we, so, and how many arborists do we have that were in your shop? So currently uh, we have 
three arborists, um, certified arborists. Um, our tree crew in total, I believe, is currently five. Yeah, it's currently five. Um, I will say that our tree warden, our very, very hard working tree warden, Greg Mossman, is also now our general superintendent of maintenance right now. Um, so our superintendent of urban forestry is Stephen Kendall at this point. Um, again, I would say that as far as the inspections go, I'm, I'm not sure the addition of uh, Arborist would speed no, that understood. up. It would certainly make them more responsible during storm events. It, uh, but I would argue that perhaps, I've said this before, and this will be my last statement before my last qu brief question, is that we really ought to work with uh, the Arnold Arboretum, it's Harvard University, you know, as a, as a pilot payment, consider working with some of their um, their graduate students, their, their botanists, phlebotomists, arborists, to see if we can help um, you know, I'm not looking to, to replace anyone, obviously. I think your, your department should grow, but to, to maybe identify some of those and get a little quicker turnaround action for people. Well, Councilor, one of the opportunities that we have, too, is if we look at the urban That's tree canopy question, yeah. on the direction of uh, Chief Blackman, is that the trees that are fully mature, it's, it's far, to be proactive and protect those existing yeah. trees is far more beneficial than planting, you know, small diameter trees Absolutely everywhere. Absolutely agree and look forward to engaging that yeah. at the hearing. Last uh, rapid fire question, Liza, favorite park in Boston, go all the way down. Uh, oh. Pine Bank. Yeah. Pine Bank, excellent choice. The Christopher Columbus Waterfront Park. Excellent. Christopher Columbus Waterfront Park. Millennium Park. I'm gonna pick the one closest to my house, Roberts. Roberts Park, excellent. Thank you all, thank, thank you, Mr. You. Chairman. Councilor Sabi George. Wow, that was once a, um, like a political debate <laughs> I question. Know. Yeah, I know. In a, in a campaign. <laughs> and you um, were all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Not one break. No, there's no wrong answer when it comes to your <laughs> That's favorite park. Right. I have uh, just a couple of follow-up questions from questions that were asked already. Um, Councilor Baker was talking about the needle pickup at some of our parks. What, who's paying for the disposal of those needles? That the parks department picks up? Oh, that's a great question, Councillor. So what actually happens, as far as who's paying for them, as far as operationally, it's the parks department, right? So it's the, it's the maintenance division who picks them up. So you've got a biohazardous pickup process? Or we, we do, and so we're, we're actually very fortunate. She unfortunately wasn't able to be here today. She usually is, but our Director of Human Resources, Diane Belfast, has really worked hard on this issue, as well as the, um, the unions, Ask Me and Cena. I can't say enough. Um, kind things about AFSCME. They've been really proactive with us, with their membership, as to developing a safe system for their employees to engage with, um, with needles because they realize the value of keeping these spaces clean. So we've developed a needle protocol with them through um, training with the Boston Public Health Commission. We had an all staff training, uh, including design and construction staff, so folks who may not be involved in any maintenance activities at all, like Liza Meyer, the design and construction unit um, was there present at the needle crew just in case we encounter it. What's interesting about that is we can't do an all staff training every year. So what Diane has developed is she actually worked with the Public Health Commission to videotape that training and every person who's onboarded at Boston Parks receives that training in video. And then it's reinforced by either their district superintendent or their foreman or general foreman. Um, so it's been a really great collaboration with AFSCME and it's, 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 it's worked out well. And what about the cost of the disposal? So what's interesting is that I would have to get back to you with that because we actually don't bear the cost of the actual disposal. We bring them, um, so the ones that our district crews pick up, we actually bring to a biohazard um, uh, unit at Franklin Park Yard, and then Public Health Commission actually okay. picks those up for us. All right, so us. That, those numbers then will be counted. It would be reflected in with, their numbers, with that's their numbers. right. Okay, that's, that's right. great. And I think that that videotape training, I'd say as important it is for personnel to know how to appropriately handle sharps, that would be good public information as well for your little leagues because we'll often be directed to call 311 and wait, but the game needs to happen. Well, that's just it. You know, you so know, a lot of parents yeah. will just go pick up. So to have yeah. that awareness, I think, would be helpful. Okay. Yep. Um, so, and then also follow up on Councillor Wu's questions about the urban wild, uh, urban wilds. Can we get more consistent op uh, money into the operational budget to 
do some of the maintenance because of sort of the inherent dangers of urban wild areas? Yeah, it's an interesting question, um, and it's one that we'd have to look at uh, along with the budget office, um, as well as our partners at the Conservation Commission. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the ownership structure there, um, and then it might be helpful, Chief, if, um, if you help answer the, the missing parts that I don't have. But what I would say is that, um, in general, we try to lend support to the maintenance operations of urban wilds out of our existence, existing maintenance budget. So when you look at maintenance, um, it's broken down by personnel. It's not really broken down by what parks they actually take care of. So, uh, you know, the group that takes care of Franklin Park is often the groups that actually takes care of Franklin Field and vice versa. So when we can, we do lend, we, we lend maintenance crew out to those urban wild spaces. What I think the advocates are 100% correct on is that they don't receive the same level of care from us because they're not listed officially as parks. Um, and again, it goes to the idea of, you know, prioritizing spaces that youth activities primarily are taking place on. And, and sometimes it's prioritizing spaces that we may get the most 311 complaints or the most calls on. Um, just as we're looking at ac equity through our capital budget, I think it behooves the Parks <coughs> Department in this partnership that we have with the Conservation Commission to look at equity um, at some of those spaces. So rather than saying, okay, well maybe there's a maintenance operations budget for urban wilds, maybe we say, can we augment uh, some of the existing maintenance activities and make a commitment <laughs> to the spaces? Chief, I don't know if you wanna talk about the stewardship of the spaces. I think that was perfect, uh, Commissioner Cook. It, you know, from an ownership perspective, it is a little bit convoluted. The, the urban wilds are actually owned by the Conservation Commission as uh, the commissioner was mentioning, and uh, the environment department had a line item to potentially purchase additional urban wilds, but in terms of the, the maintenance and the ongoing care of those facilities, it's really out of the, the goodness of the care of our open space that the parks department has been really supplementing the ability of the staff to, to care for those as they identify any issues through some of their stewardship uh, from a, a policy perspective. It's certainly an area where we could probably do better, uh, but it is an area that Commissioner Cook and his team have spent a considerable amount of resources on based on our residents and advocates' stewardship as well. I would wonder if there's, a, you know, I, I certainly don't want to end up in a situation where we're pit, pitting sort of the active right. play spaces with urban wilds because we all have our sort of favorite type of fields. But I wonder if, especially if the urban wilds um, lend themselves to some of the grants, mm -hmm. um, that if we could be more thoughtful about getting grants or, and they may not even be available at the same degree, but grants that could be used towards operational uh, maintenance issues as opposed to capital improvements. Yeah, I think we owe the advocates and obviously the city council, but also ourselves uh, to be more thoughtful about this. You know, parks and recreation doesn't stop at the fence gate of the soccer field, right? right. You know, we also have an, uh, a, uh, a responsibility to be the stewards of the environment. Um, and so when we look at the ecological value of some of these spaces, I mean, the locations of the vernal pools and everything else that the city benefits from, those are in the urban wilds and if it's on, it's on us to help the Conservation Commission clean that up. I think we should look at any possible revenue streams to try to fix it. Great, and then my last question for this round um, is, you know, we often get calls from constituents regarding a particular park, um, but then we come to find out it's DCR <laughs> land. I imagine that that also happens with 311 calls about particular issues. Yes. Can we talk a little, you know, how, how can we better delineate, I think uh, Chief, is ready to answer that question between those two. Uh, I'll be psyched if he answers that. No, I, I, thought I, saw, I thought I saw an anxious hand ready to no, go up. Not at all, and uh, Commissioner Cook should absolutely feel free to, to jump in it, here Is as it well. on 311 though? If someone well, calls in about a particular park, 
it, it's to be fair to, to 311, it, it's broader than that. It's actually an underlying technological issue uh, within the system, not the, the staff up there who do a phenomenal job of uh, taking these requests and getting them to the, the responsible agencies. Um, it's something that as we upgrade those systems, we are trying to solve that technological issue so that there's a little bit better connection uh, with our, our partners over at the state and also, frankly, back to the constituent as well. Um, it's one thing to tell the constituent, oh, hey, this is DCR, um, you need to call this number. It's another to actually be able to pass that on to the to DCR, the right person over there, and then also be able to get back to the constituent and let them know that that message had been handed off. And if there is a tracking number or whatever there may be to whatever the partner agency is, that's where we ultimately want to be. Um, and part of the upgrade to the system that we're doing right now is hopefully we'll be able to get in that direction, have much more of that specificity around the geography to know when those those transfers need to happen. I think it hey, might, might be helpful. That you would want to add to that? No. Might be helpful if we could have, at least in our offices, and I'm, I'm sure the Office of Neighborhood Services would appreciate it too, a list or just a list of what's our parks sure. and what's state parks. Yeah, Aldo Guerin, who's actually our senior planner, he actually just developed for us, and it was at the request of um, Councillor Kim Janey as well, um, because it does get very confusing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, sometimes those signs aren't that big, and it's it's very difficult. And at the end of the day, you know, a kid playing soccer shouldn't have to worry about whether or not it's the governor or the mayor's park. The park right. just needs to be clean. So right. we're happy to provide the council with that list. We actually just generated it ourselves this week. So. Great. I'll save the rest of my Great. questions for the long round. Councillor Flynn. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor. See you all. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And... Um, as it relates to uh, Saunders Stadium, I know we talked about it briefly. Um, it's well used, soccer. Um, it also has a, a lacrosse sure. uh, track and fields. It's also used by the public school kids as well. Um, what's the long term plan for um, Saunders Stadium? Yeah, so I'll, I'll let Liza talk a little bit about the Mokley Park vision plan and the, the efforts that we're making there. Uh, I will say that over the past two or three weeks, uh, we've, we've had a, a really, really strong partnership with the Boston Police Department because mm -hmm. we've had an issue with chronic homeless in Saunders Stadium, which I've, I've actually never seen before. Um, and so the police have been going over there on a regular basis and on, on two occasions during a lacrosse game, they actually had to break up a homeless encampment over there. So we're very, very grateful to the police department for working with us on that. As far as we look at long term, Saunders Stadium is interesting because the activities are, are vital, important to the South Boston identity. I mean, people come from all over the city right. to use the space, but when you really look at some of the South Boston groups that are based there, I don't think there's any version of Moakley Park that doesn't include some sort of athletic stadium, and it's probably going to be still called Saunders. What I will say is, is that the precise location of that? Is that the right size of that? Is that the right type of field? Because there's a lot of things about Saunders that doesn't work. When you look at the <coughs> um, miles of um, uh, storage containers that we have out there, it really takes up a lot of space and it also creates those, those shadowy spaces for bad things to happen in there. Mm -hmm. So when we go into full renovation of Moakley, I think the thinking behind Saunders has to be first and foremost. Liza, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit through the vision plan. Sure. So as you know, the vision plan for Oakley Park is underway and we've had one uh, public open house so far and there'll be more community events to come. And through that process, we're gaining input from um, park users as well as um, current permit permittees, permit holders um, who frequent these spaces. And the ultimate vision for Oakley Park will be one that balances these kinds of active recreation permitted uses with the demands for climate resilience and neighborhood spaces um, all in one park, which we feel confident we, we can do given the size of Moakley Park. <coughs> no, thank you, and we appreciate that. I'm at Moakley Park at least several times a week, and I know Councilor Sabi George is, is down there as well. Uh, so it's well, it's well utilized. Um, so I just want to say thank you for all your help on that on that issue. I appreciate Council, just so you know, it's our second most permitted park in the system after Boston Common. That's how okay. busy it is. 
Well, thank you for that. Um, I want to say thank you, um, helping the 8th Street Neighborhood Association out, getting uh, water access at Watson Park. Yeah. We appreciate that. Um, Peters Park, I know we spoke about that sure. several times, Commissioner. Um, I was there with the mayor and with the uh, police commissioner for opening of uh, baseball, um, baseball program two weeks ago. But they do have some flooding issues oh, yeah. um, over at Peters Park. I know you are working on it, and um, you know the basketball court could be updated as well. Um, again, I know you're working hard, but any um, any updates on that? I, I I actually got great news about that. So so we're actually including the basketball courts as part of our various courts contract, mm -hmm. and the reason we're doing that is so much of the work that we're going to have to do at Peters Park with some of those mitigation funds that the community fought so hard for with some of the developments adjacent to the park is going to go into that infrastructure that you were speaking about. I mean, if, if we make any improvements at Peters Park but don't fix the drainage, I think Ted Pietris and everybody else will, will come for us for, with pitchforks if it starts <laughs> to flood again, right? And so we have to make sure that it doesn't flood. Their concern, and I think they were right to feel this way, is you're going to spend all this money on infrastructure, whether it's fences or irrigation or curbing or, or drainage. Yeah, the park might look a little bit better, but what about the parts of the park that most kids use? So we were able to tap into that various courts contract, and is it September or spring, Dennis? I can't remember for Peters Park. Uh, it's September. It's a, yeah, it's September, uh, P Peters Park. So what we'll do is you'll just see one comprehensive project, but basically the improvements to Peters will be partnered with that various courts um, improvement to the basketball court. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I know Councilor Janey mentioned it earlier, South End, Library Park, our districts kind of overlap a little bit. Um, so we both share that area. And um, I know you are doing some work on that area, in, the, in that park rather. Um, you have any more information about the South End Library Park? Yeah, the the long and short of it is that the the budget, um, excuse me, the bids came in high, and so that we have to discuss with the uh, the budget office what our next steps are, whether it's value engineering or if it's a rebid situation that we don't think we got favorable bids. What I would say, as far as the description of what's happening there, it's it's really been in concert with the friends of the South End Library Park. I would describe it as a refurbishment of the original design, with the exception of maybe the eradication of the bluestone. I can't. Right, yeah. and some additional site furnishings that'll support the kind of use people want to see there. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward project. Yeah, it's a, it's a better version of itself. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to report back to City Council what the resolution is of the fact that the bids came in high, but um, bids are coming in consistently high on a, a lot of our projects. Okay, final question. Um, I had a conversation several times with the mayor on um, Chinese veterans, um, in Chinatown, served our country honorably. They're looking for some type of recognition, some type of um, maybe a little square or, or a park. Um, I do support this. I do know the mayor mentioned he does support it as well. But just um, if you could, if you could also keep it in the back of your mind that you know these these Chinese um, served our country. They served our country honorably, and um, we would like to have some type of official recognition for their service to our country some sometime. Um, so if there's any thoughts you had on it, or if you want to talk offline, but that's something that's important to uh, the Chinese community. Uh, well, I think that it, it sounds like it's a tremendously important project. I think the most, uh, the easiest step forward was if, uh, if I could organize a, a walk with the Public Works Department and the, and the group, and we could, I mean, you could walk through Chinatown a, a morning, so I, I think if we could identify a location, that might be a first step. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Edwards. Uh, uh, Follow-ups. I actually wanted to ask about um, Charlestown, specifically on the, um, in Charlestown High School on the field, I guess because it's turf uh, during the summer, you're getting heat from the top yeah. and kind of from the bottom. And so one of the requests uh, constituents had was, is there any way we can have some sort of canopy for those sitting at least, I don't know how we can make sure there's some kind of shade, especially for those players who are waiting to play. Um, it, could we work together on getting that done? Yeah, so there's a couple of different interventions that we could do. And frankly, we lost time um, pursuing uh, one intervention, which was that we 
thought we could receive funds from an external partner that's right. interested in shade structure and parks. Uh, that didn't materialize, um, but um, especially when you look at the dugouts, uh, mm -hmm. shade structures can probably go in there. Right. Um, as far as their suitability for long-term um, solution, I think you'd be looking at uh, maybe um, waiting for Charles Town Field to receive capital funds in, okay. in, the, in the budget. But I think there's interventions that you could do relatively soon there. Um, we're happy to cost those out and look at GPI for a solution. Um, I also think that they would be a really good candidate for Community Preservation Act because right. when you look at the heat island effect from the artificial turf fields that we're installing, it's it's appreciable. Mm -hmm. um, even on safety surfacing, just that safety surfacing we put in tot lots, there's often a 10 to 15 degree difference. Right. Um, and just staying on the, on the vein of Charlestown, yeah. um, what was the timeline for the capital improvements for Ryan Park? Sure, so. Um, it's near the Shreff's building. Yeah. We have some initial studies from the Climate um, Ready Boston study of East Boston and Charlestown mm -hmm. that suggest that our first consideration of that park did not take into consideration the, the needs related to resiliency there, and we need to ask for a more substantive investment in the park, and I think we'll have to do that in concert with the Environment Department yeah. um, in order to move everything forward. Right now, it's it's a project that's in the out years of our budget. I'll, I'll let Chief talk about the Climate Ready Charlestown work that happened, but Councilor, I'll, I'll just throw in my two cents that I think it would be a, a, a huge mistake to move on the park until the resolution of what's happening, the final design of the road is 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 finished For there Rutherford. yeah okay. yeah because it's going to affect the the main entryway for the park and also how people can get to the park um if we just went in there and did a, a fairly standard capital renovation we would have it, it's possible that we could literally put some of the playing fields in in the wrong place to buy us a little bit of time we actually put it into our various fields work that happened this last season um, we had a little trouble with the contractor, so uh, they weren't ready for opening day, but now the fields are all fully operational. So we put in, you know, um, I think 60, at $60,000? Yeah, it was, it was kind of a joint, they, they put in some of their okay. money, it was $25,000 from the community that, that they had aside in almost 30,000 of our own money. Mm -hmm. um, in that project, Chris, we did look at putting dugout straight yep. shade structures in, but they yeah. became too costly to put in with that budget. We were going to have to omit some of the other field renovations to do it, so we decided to look at that as we did the major renovation. That mm -hmm. that buys us a little bit of time. It, I think Ryan's going to be very important for climate resiliency. So uh, don't, I'm sorry, don't want to cut you off, but just because I know I'm cognizant of time, um, estimate about a time when you would start. I, I, we could follow up on the resiliency and then the planning, but do you have any? estimate about a time well I, I think it would be a mistake to not move on the park in the next five years I mean the the okay. tot lots and the fields are mm -hmm. all are all aging mm -hmm. um, but again I would think we'd have to look at what we're doing with the road project and, and part of that is really the communication you are having about Rutherford Ave and the road and the restructuring of Sullivan Square so how often do you talk with the state and the MBTA and all those folks about that coordination yeah sorry so, to cut you off to you uh, no I was gonna answer that question specifically um, because one of the very first investments that we're going to be making is actually part of that Sullivan Square redesign mm -hmm. for a resiliency perspective. It's mm -hmm. raising Main Street. Mm -hmm. So we're actually in ongoing conversations right now, not only internally from a transportation perspective, but also with DOT, also with Massport, who has a, uh, a mm -hmm. rail line that they own that goes across Main Street. Uh, right now, I believe that's in the capital budget right now uh, for FY20 and 21. Uh, we will see it, um, it, whether we can move that forward or if it slips backward. But as the commissioner was saying, we certainly need to understand exactly what that road project is going to look like as we evaluate the resiliency components of the Main Street investment and also the investments that we make into the Ryan Playground. Thank you. And, and Council, we, we'd be happy to share. Liza Meyer wrote a fairly detailed comment letter on that project and how it would relate to the park. We'd be happy to share it. I'm happy to see it. Yeah. And thank you. And just finally, on um, Paul Revere, um, so we brought this up at DPW, excited about it, expecting it to be done. 
this year? Yeah. 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 So about when? Uh, I, I, in fairness, I think it'll be spring. I mean, we'll, we'll start construction, but any construction on most park projects is at least two seasons when mm -hmm. you look at establishment and the fact that we have to do a lot of tree work there. Um, the restoration of the Prado, Paul Revere Mall is, right. is truly that, you know, it's a restoration of the shirt lift design and making sure that it's ADA compliant. There's no reason of having the Freedom, Freedom Trail not be a place that people of all abilities can visit. So we're really excited about adding that. Um, but we do have to go fairly methodical and fairly um, thoughtfully there mm -hmm. or else we'd be in danger of hurting some of those, that amazing canopy in the North End. So. Right, and then just a comment. Um, to echo what my colleagues have said about the urban wilds and what my constituent also mentioned, it is a big deal for us to have some sort of maintenance. And it is the work that Magdalena has done yeah. on the other side and, and actually climbing over that fence and cleaning up the back end uh, in a place that no one else is bothering. She has done amazing work. So it would be wonderful to see the city step up as well yeah. to support her. Um, and then finally, um, the Friends of the Bremen Street, of the Bremen Street Park, um, in East Boston, or the Greenway, excuse me, and um, they've recently yep. gotten a grant, and I'm excited to, you know, for, for, you know, continue this conversation with you afterwards, but I really am hopeful that we're going to talk about the best way to use that private funding from the Bar Foundation and really make um, our park one of the best parks. I love what, the, what you've done with the trees. I've loved that work, but I feel like there's so much, so many more things we can do with that massive amount of open space, so thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Sabi George. Oh, back to me already? Yeah. All right. Last one's left. Um, okay, so I have a, um, a couple of questions about the relationship between the Parks Department and the Boston Public Schools. Great. And I think the really important role that we could use, and I think uh, it was brought up a little bit in public testimony about some of our playgrounds, but really the I think the coordination and cooperation that could happen using Build BPS as a way to improve some of our park facilities that our schools use for athletics. Sure. So is the, the question how we how we work with them? What's the partnership? Yeah. What's the potential investment? And so in um, some areas, it's very specific. And in some areas, it's very general. So the places where it's very specific is where there's BPS property that we take care of. Uh, so those places would be places like Charlestown High, places like English High, places like what we call uh, Millennium Park Phase 2 or what you might call Raiders Field, that's what the actual sign says, out at West Roxbury High or West Roxbury High uh, Athletic Facility. Those are BPS properties that the Boston Parks Department maintains. Now, where we maintain those, it actually makes a lot of sense because BPS does not have a lot of staff that it knows how to take care of a turf facility. Um, they may not have packers, right, because they're working with janitorial staff, so they probably just have a dumpster, so it's not like they can drive around with a packer and, and peel off trash. So those are very specific relationships and that, that um, are very clear and delineated. Then there's a lot of flexible spaces where the relationship um, could benefit from more definition, and it's something that uh, I've been working very closely with John Hanlon at the school department as, as is Dennis Roach, about what is the best way to create the most uh, efficient system possible for the city. You shouldn't, uh, it's always the same issue that we run into with public works. You know, you shouldn't have two piles of sand in one neighborhood, right? There should only be one pile of sand in a neighborhood and uh, different departments should have the ability to access that. So we're starting those conversations now um, as far as operations goes. As far as capital planning, what you don't see in our capital plan is sort of the universe of taught lots and playgrounds that BPS has. Usually that falls to the BPS capital plan to prioritize um, and they would be better to, to speak to those. What I will say is that there are opportunities where it makes sense for us operationally that we can help out BPS in a strategic way. So when you look at the Beethoven School in West Roxbury, um, which selfishly I'm just very familiar with because my daughter attends there, the, the, the way the park is set up is that there's a public access to it. It's not enclosed within the, within the school itself like the Linden might be where the tot lot's sort of like in the middle of the building. Um, there's people who use the park even when school's in session. 
those are locations that it's easier for us to take a stronger maintenance role on. And, and what we haven't done is an inventory of whether those places are so that we could help out BPS. Okay, now what I really would like to see is a, a strong investment from Build BPS with parks to improve our uh, playing fields for our high school teams because yeah. they're quote unquote parks property. Um, they should, but they're used by our students, our student athletes, that they should receive some of that investment. So what I'd like to see as part of sort of the work ahead when we think about investment is that that's part of the conversation. And I've, I've stressed that to, to BPS and, and really want, um, I would like to see that investment happen because I think we don't have um, great fields for our kids to play on. So how do we create those opportunities and we have to do it in partnership with parks, no doubt. Um, and that brings me to restrooms and field houses in sure. our parks. As a parent of a, of a daughter um, and as a, as a former girls coach, um, restrooms are really important, especially in girls sports. Not that they, they are also necessary for boys yeah. sports, but in a, in a, it's not as critical. Um, but even if I think back to, you know, just with coaching and our high school teams, to have real benches in a field house, not a field house, I'd love a field house, but to have some sort of facility that kids can change, use a restroom, store equipment, sure. I think is, is critical. Never mind an opportunity for some of our uh, youth sports teams to have a concession stand or to, right. again, store equipment and ice packs and stuff like that. Can we talk a little bit about the possibility of including restrooms in uh, any of our capital improvements? Yeah. How do you feel about porta potties? Ah, uh, the fancy ones? Mm -hmm. I'm okay with. Well, so, so I have a good story there. Because <laughs> there are some nicer porta potties That's right. that can provide. Counselor, you couldn't be more correct. Not every porta potty is created the same. <laughs> all right. So what what I will and none say, of them are cleaned <laughs> as often as that's right. many of them. That's right. So what you have is you have an ecosystem where it's unconscionable to not allow mothers and children and fathers to use a restroom facility in an open space. The idea is to get someone to a park so that they can receive all the benefits, the public health benefits of a park, and then you literally ask them to leave the moment the child or the senior citizen or the parent themselves have to use a facility for whatever reason they have. So when there's an opportunity, we have to provide that. We have to look at it the same way we look at it as a park bench. We have to look at it the same way we look at trees to cool, cool down the athletic fields. It has to be part of the infrastructure of the park. That doesn't make it an easy problem to solve. Where it's very, very difficult to solve, um, we are looking at uh, what I would describe as enhanced uh, portable toilets. So if you go to Portland right now, there's a, there's a system called the Portland Loo, um, where it, it actually is basically, um, <clears throat> it has some plumbing associated with it. Uh, it's not the kind of bathroom that you would want to spend <laughs> a lot of time in, but if you, if it, it's very efficient at doing the one thing it's there to provide. Um, that might be a good fit for a neighborhood park. Where we have the ability to create a larger space, such as Almont Park and Mattapan, what we try to do is we try to create um, concrete pads so that we can line up the porta potties within a shed so they're not receiving a battering from the elements and that they can be serviced on a very regular mm -hmm. basis and, and be cleaned. What the worst, the, the last resort is what you often most see. And this is why we're gonna have to uh, deal with this in this generational capital planning, is where you see the league that rents the porta potty and it's chained up against the fence. And there may be three or four of those porta potties within a park and nobody wants to go in any of them. And that's only if you had even had the key to get into them. That's something that we really got to get out of the business of doing. So we got to look at these shade structures to line up the porta potties where we can introduce something like the Portland Lou system, which has plumbing, but really acts 
mostly like a porta potty where you're just coming in and that's the only feature. And then where we have the opportunity that makes sense for the volume of play, places like Moakley, I think you have to look at preserving these field houses and making them available. One thing I want to give uh, Dennis Roach credit with in partnership with Parkway um, uh, Girls Softball is we've actually given them the ability not only just for Pop Warner football games, but now for the Parkway Girls Softball League to use the Billings Field House. And I think what we're doing, we're cleaning it once a week. Is that yeah, what we're doing? Clean once a week. It's a it's a six week pilot program for the rest of the season that they have access on Saturday and Sundays all day to use that um, those, those restrooms or the field house. Because that's the really frustrating part when people see these structures and they can't have access to them, and that's where we really need those strong nonprofit partners. Um, so the answer is we got to do a better job. We are doing a better job as part of our capital work, but when you look at 220 parks, if we're doing 10 or 15 parks, it's, it's going to be a long slog to get where we need to be. Right. Well, that's, and that's why I think the Build BPS um, financial uh, investment can be a part of also related to the Parks Department because indoor and outdoor um, academic experiences are important to our kids. Um, where am I? All right, I'll, I, I do have one more question. I'll, um, I'll wait till my next turn. No, you're back. Okay, <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, Geese, yeah. can we just talk a little bit about um, the, the, the mitigation that we're able to do as a department sure. regarding geese? Because they really are destroying um, so many of our parks and really have a very negative uh, impact on the investment that we make as a city on our parks. Yeah, no, it's, it's. I mean, there's, you can't overstate it. It's, it's just disgusting. The impact of the waste that they produce, the amount of waste that just one, um, one goose. bird can, yeah, one goose can produce. Um, I recently went to Moakley Park. I mean, it was it was borderline unplayable until our maintenance crews got in there and blew down as much of it as they could and, and raked it out. That was right before opening day. Um, I will say, you know, that the cleaner the field, um, it seems the less likely they are to keep congregating there. I don't know if that's more because of the activity on the field or, or what our maintenance crews are doing, but it's something that, um, we, we lack a very core ability to deal with. I mean, it's we don't have a, a maintenance line to deal with um, getting geese off our parks, and they are impactful. And so they, they, they cause quite the headache for our maintenance crews. And it's work that we don't like asking them mm -hmm. to do because it's filthy work. I, I do think that um, it's something that as a region, not just the Northeast, but also the central United States. I mean, this is an invasive species, and with all respect to the federal government and the protections that are afforded to these birds, um, I think we need to take a look at the, the public health impact. That's before you get to the ecological impact of the phosphorus that these, these geese are putting into our waterways. Chief, well, I don't know if there's anything you want to there, I mean, there's also an impact on a, a couple of significantly sized waterways, including right. one in Councilor Siomo's district. Chandler Pond has had to be dredged because of the amount of waste that collects um, in that pond. And I mean, the Parks Department has been very supportive in some of the efforts that are happening at Chandler Pond, in particular with the Geese Police. I hope that you'll continue uh, supporting that work. And then also, you know, supporting the work of your rangers with the uh, egg addling. That's right. And so we're over 300 eggs addled for the season. So we're very proud of it. Was, and I really got to give all the credit to uh, Jen McNeil, yep. um, who's the ranger most involved with that program. Um, but it, it is, it, and I don't want to minimize because it's really important. I would, I would, I would really hate to think what the population uh, would be if they didn't do that addling. But it's clearly not uh, eliminating the problem either. Right. So. Right. No, it's it's not yeah. enough, and it's um, dirty, nasty work, mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to measure the the population, and it just continues to it continues to grow. Um, I do have one more question because I think that Councilor Campbell asked about uh, the Peace Garden, but it, was she referenc referencing the Odom Peace Garden in particular? Can we talk just a little bit about the plans for the Odom Peace Garden? Sure, I'll let Liza talk specifically about it, but we're very excited. Um, 
there's a small section of Mattapan that actually represents um, one of the only th one of only three spaces in Boston that residents can't get to a park within a 10 minute walk. Um, in Mattapan, it's not really a lack of green space, but it's more um, how complicated some of the roads are uh, to make uh, ease of crossing to some of those green spaces are because they are served by Almont and on the high park side. Ross, which are these major athletic facilities. Um, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to add green space to Mattapan with the Stephen Odom Serenity Garden. Um, but probably the most important thing is that we're honoring the Odoms and their commitment to peace um, and the loss of their son. This is long overdue. Boston Parks is honored to be part of this work. The, the space is already claimed by the Odom family. We have a sign out there designating for the space. The last bit of it is the community process that we're engaged with now to design it. But I will say that the site is complicated by the fact that we have to coordinate with the, an adjacent development. Right, and the, so the de actual final um, construction of the park will be um, done at the end of the building project just because of the way you have to sequence it to mm -hmm. access the site for the building project. So um, right now they're looking at 2020, 2021 for the, for the building in terms of their um, access to funding. If there's something that we can do between now and then to improve the space and make it um, sort of more inviting for use over the next few years, we'll do that. Kathy Baker Eclipse, our project manager, is working on that. Um, I mean, it's already an open space and does serve some value to the community, but if we can make it more inviting and more accessible for the next few years until we can build the final version, we'll do that. Okay, great. Great, and then I'll just do a couple of thank yous. Um, we've gotten a number of calls over the last two years to replace um, either to damaged or lost, um, like Hero Square and Park Square dedication sign. So I just appreciate uh, Commissioner, your team's effort and just being quickly responsive to that and doing that because it's important for our families. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dennis for the work with the golf courses and really opening them up. And I, I'd like to see so much more of that, uh, both at Franklin Field and at, at Franklin Park and at uh, George Reichs. I think that's just a really great way to engage the non-golfing community in those public spaces. And then, um, do we have anything in the pipeline with public and private public-private partnerships for any of our park spaces? Uh, in the pipeline? Yeah. Um, it, well, so yes. I mean, so we're, we're we're always exploring any partnerships that we can have, but we have a few active ones that we're very. Oh, pleased we've got with. active ones. We don't have anything that we're planning on in the future. Something uh, that doesn't exist or. Well, I think so. I'll, I'll tell you the places for opportunity that we don't we don't have anything. Um, we don't have a partner identified. Uh, Moakley is is a is a great. I mean, when you look at uh, the ideas that are coming through the vision plan, it's difficult to imagine that when that park is done, Boston Parks would be taking care of it by itself. You know, you would imagine that you would probably have some sort of conservancy or some friends group or maybe a corporate partner associated with it because it just has to. It has to work on so many levels. It not only has to protect the neighborhood from flooding, but it also has to be this great recreational feature. The other place really is Harambee, which is also known as Franklin Field. I mean, it's 45 acres. Um, I think we'd be remiss if we weren't looking at uh, private-public partnerships for, for those two facilities. Great. If I, I can just add to that, uh, Councillor, there are certainly other areas in the city that are at climate risk where we've got many partners who have expressed interest in participating in that, and so we'll certainly keep you abreast if any of those developments come to light, whether it's related to open space or otherwise. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I adjourn, I just wanted to thank you um, and Paul McCaffrey, especially uh, on behalf of Representative Hone and his 30-year women's league uh, that was displaced for a good reason, the renovation of Smith's Park, tried to relocate to Ringer and got some um, unfortunate pushback, and you guys were able to turn on a dime and get Rogers Park ready, and I think it's working fine. That uh, and just to let you know, um, our Attorney General Mara Healy is an alum of that basketball league as well. So um, there's some great stuff, and I know Kevin really appreci appreciated that.
quick turnaround. Well, we appreciate everything he does for the park system. So. Thanks. Um, with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, so, do you want five minutes? Today. 24, thank you. Um, like to remind folks this is a public hearing uh, broadcast and recorded on RCN 82, Comcast Channel 8, Verizon 1964, and streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV. I'd ask folks in the chamber to silence their cell phones and electronic devices. At the conclusion of the uh, presentation by the department and questions from my colleagues. We will have public testimony. There is a sign in sheet to my left. We ask that you check the box if you do wish to testify and please uh, supply your name, address, affiliation. Uh, on June 5th, we will have a hearing dedicated to public testimony that will run between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, and we are here again with our friends from the Parks Department to discuss the annual Parkman Fund appropriation as it pertains to docket 0582, message and order authorizing the appropriation of $1,200,000 for the income of the George Francis Parkman Fund. The funds are to be expended under the direction of the Par Commissioner of Parks and Recreation for the maintenance and improvements of Boston Common and parks in existence since January 12th, 1887. Uh, again, I'm joined by my friend and colleague from Dorchester City Council at Large, Anissa Sabi George. I want to welcome back uh, Commissioner Cook, Dennis, and Nicole. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Councillor. Uh, I'll, I'll give it over to uh, Dennis Roach, our Director of Administration and Finance, and uh, Nicole to speak through the specifics Great. about how critical this fund is, but I, have, I can't stress enough um, how wonderful an opportunity this is. I mean, really just from the generosity of one family um, more than a century ago uh, in their commitment to parks, that here we are in 2018 and we're actually able to operate um, with enhanced operations because of the generosity of this one family. So we're very grateful uh, to the budget department for suggesting this allocation. We're very grateful to the trust and to the treasury uh, division, their director, uh, Drew Smith. Um, and we really look forward to partnering with the city council to make sure that we use these funds in an appropriate manner. Uh, we urge your support of allocating them. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dennis. Thank you. And I'm just going to give a quick update on the, it's the George Francis Parkman Trust Fund. Uh, the, 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 all, the, all, the, all the park funds benefit the Boston Parks Department. Um, specifically in certain parks that were allocated back in the fund in the, in the early 1920s. The, uh, the parks that this, this fund benefits is the Boston Common, the Public Garden, the Fens, the Riverway, Olmstead Park, Jamaica Pond, Franklin Park, Highland Park and Roxbury, Horatio Harris Park, and Malcolm X Park. So this fund was, was, was set aside to support these particular funds, the operation and maintenance of these parks. Um, the fund currently sits at about $25 million today. Um, in which uh, investment income of about $1.2 million is advocated for the year to fund the operations of these particular parks. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Duhamel. She can kind of break down a little bit of the detail about what the $1.2 million is spent for annually. Uh, so $950,000 goes to maintenance personnel, $100,000 goes towards the rangers, and then the remaining funds um, go to things such as irrigation systems, fountain maintenance, um, purchasing of supplies such as stone dust, flowers, um, pest and disease control for the rose bushes, um, equipment, tree trimming, pruning and removals, and turf maintenance. Great. Um, what is the balance of the fund? Do you have? It, you know? It's it's twenty four point five five nine six million. Wow. So that's what the, the total fund is. Right. We get the investment income each year. Right. So to your point earlier, good bang for the buck a century later. Um, Councilor Sabi, George, do you have any questions? No, thank Great. you. Great. 
Um, great. Uh, as this is an annual appropriation, pretty, pretty uh, spelled out. Let me um, acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilor, Councilor Josh Zakem. Do you have any questions? No. Thanks for attending. Anybody else? No. Seeing and hearing none, I want to thank you again for your time and attention today. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>